Hi, welcome back guys. This is your sensei, back with another fanfiction. This is the first part of, What if Naruto discovered summoning contract? Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Aki was feeling down today. Check that, he fell down most days despite his mask of happiness that he wears on a daily basis. The reason behind this was that he was in a constant state of loneliness. Now most kids at the age of 7 would maybe have a friend or two and would most likely have an adult guardian of some sort who would be with them on a daily basis. Naruto was not most 7 year olds, however, because he had found out early in his life that most adults would ignore him for the most part, save for the occasional insult thrown his way. The adults, in turn would tell their children to avoid him at all costs, saying things that he was a bad child that would hurt them if they got to close. This was not true, however. The reason behind why the adults seemed to want nothing to do with the boy was because, on the day Naruto was born, a terrible monster called the Nine-Tailed Fox Demon nearly destroyed the village. The village's current leader, the fourth Hakage, had to seal this beast away into the infant Naruto, as killing the fox would only delay the destruction until he formed again in a few years. The ceiling cost the fourth Hakage his life, but before he died he asked that the boy would be treated as a hero for containing the demon. The villagers, however, mostly ignored this order due to the mental scars held from the fox's attack. While the people of Kanoa did not do anything to physically harm the boy, they made sure that he would not feel wanted by basically ignoring his existence since before he could talk. None of the children knew that Naruto held the fox, thanks to a law that the third Hakage passed after he retook his mantle after the death of his predecessor. However, as previously mentioned, the villagers were able to find a loophole in the third's law. While they could not directly tell their children about why to avoid Naruto, they settled for telling them to stay away from the boy and trusting that the children would obey their parents. Because of this, Naruto has spent the majority of his young life alone, with the exception of visits from the third Hakage, who Naruto had come to view as a surrogate grandfather figure, as well as Aim and Chuchai Ikaraku who owned the ramen stand that he frequently visited. There was also Urukei Sensei, who while at first seemed to act wary of the boy, had later seemed to warm up to him somewhat and actually answered his questions at the academy, as opposed to the other teachers who just ignored him like the rest of the villagers. Even with these few people in his life, Naruto found most of his time alone because the people that were nice to them couldn't fit time outside of their busy work lives to constantly be with him. There were some students at the academy who seemed friendly enough, namely among the clan heirs, but a majority seemed to act indifferent to Naruto's presence. Early in his life, Naruto had discovered that acting sad didn't make his problems go away, so he made up a mask of a hapagalaki goof who pranked a majority of the villagers at one time or another. This did not, however, alleviate the heartbreak he felt whenever he saw other children playing with each other in the park or whenever he saw happy families going through town together. Today was different from the usual emotional pain, however. Naruto had just left the academy after being thoroughly beaten by the class's top student, Sasuke Uchiha. While the loss itself had hurt, it was how the other students laughed and mocked him that really got to him. While he might enjoy doing the occasional prank to get people to acknowledge him, the fact that the students were laughing at his failure weighed heavily with his other emotional baggage. The thing that really got to him was that there wasn't a single sympathetic face in the jeering crowd to give him some comfort at his loss. Well, there was one, but Naruto didn't notice this as the pale lavender-eyed girl lowered her head in a shy manner the second he looked her way. Naruto was wandering through the dense forest surrounding the village of Kanoa, trying to clear his head from the torrent of depressing thoughts. I wonder if I'll ever have any friends, Naruto thought sadly, maybe this wouldn't hurt so badly if there was someone I could truly relate to. So caught up in his thoughts that Naruto completely missed the route in his path until he tripped over it and tumbled into a hidden hole off the side of the path he was walking on. Oof, Naruto cried out as he hit the hard stone floor of the hole he fell through. Oh great, as if this day wasn't bad enough as it was already Naruto whined as he picked himself up and shook the cobwebs in his head. Where am I? I've never seen this place before. It almost looks like it was built Naruto noticed as he looked at the carved walls and floor with the little light provided to him through the hole in the ceiling. Whoa, this place is kind of freaky looking. It almost looks like something out of a cliche horror anime that old man Hawkage sometimes let me watch. I better get out of here before something else happens wait a second. How am I supposed to get out Naruto yelped as he then noticed that there were no steps or way to climb out of the hole he fell through 10 feet above his head. Well isn't this just awesome? First there was that match against Sasuke team and now I get trapped in some hole in the middle of the frickin' forest Naruto grumbled out loud. Well, no sense sitting around here better sees if there's another way out that I can actually reach man. I hate being short Naruto reasoned as he started looking through the deep hole he fell through, careful not to stray too far from the light so he wouldn't become even more lost. Suddenly, Naruto's hand felt a switch along the wall and, being the curious child that he was, decided to press it to see what would happen, regardless of the consequences. A door panel to his right immediately shot open, and Naruto could make out a dim light at the end of the tunnel. Thinking it was a possible way out Naruto carefully edged his way down the corridor. He jumped with a yelp as the door panel suddenly slammed shut behind him trying to prevent his beating heart from jumping out of his chest. Naruto took a nervous gulp to swallow the lump in his throat and continued his way down the tunnel. 
When he reached the light, Naruto gapped at what he saw. It seemed he had found his way into some old abandoned temple of some sorts. There were old scrolls and books lining up the walls and the ceiling was made of a beautiful painted glass that gave off a mysterious glow. Despite the fact that it was obviously underground and there was no sunlight present to explain where the light was coming from. Naruto looked around the room, hoping to find some form of an escape route. Finding none, he sighed and then decided to look through the scrolls. While Naruto normally did not enjoy reading, he reasoned that he might be able to find a map of this place so he could figure out where the exit was, or at least find out wherever here was after an hour of searching Naruto was starting to lose hope that he would ever find a way out of this place. I wonder how long it will be before the old man realizes that I'm gone, Naruto muttered. What if nobody finds me down here, or worse, what if no one even bothers to come looking for me Naruto thought with a start. Just as Naruto was about to break down and cry, he noticed a scroll that was slightly above the others on the shelf. What stood out about this scroll was that it was incredibly thick with decorative handles sticking out of both sides, and the fact that it had a necklace of some sort wrapped around it that had six magenta beads in the shape of comma marks surrounding it. His curiosity perked, Naruto took the scroll off the shelf and started into a coughing fit as the dust from the shelf poured right on his face. The first thing he noticed was that the scroll was incredibly old, but wasn't brittle at all despite the obvious age the parchment carried. As Naruto carefully unfurled the scroll, he also took note that the words written in them were clear as day, but were written in a very old dialect. It took Naruto a good 30 minutes, but he was finally able to summarize what the paper said. In its contents it stated, To whoever finds this place, let it be known that those with ill intent can never use the contents of this room, for there are special seals placed at the entrance that prohibit anyone but the purest of hearts from entering. As for whom I am, my name has long since been cast aside for my quest, but most people have taken to calling me the Sage of the Six Paths, and these are a recollection of my life. Some say that I am the father of modern ninjutsu, and while that is true to an extent thanks to the power I possess called the Rinnegan, I did not learn my abilities on my own. A few years after I had unlocked the powers of my eyes and had started to master the energies located in myself and every living being, called Chakra by some, I had discovered a group of races that live outside our dimension. These beings are similar to the animals of our world, however they all possess intelligence equal to or greater than humanity's. I have found out that these beings also have an understanding of chakra, even more so than my own. I felt that there is much to be gained by working with these different races, so I went to study under the multitude of different animal clans. From the toad sages to the healing slugs and the violent snakes, they all have a different fighting style and philosophy on life itself. It was through them that I was able to learn as much as I did. If they were not around to guide me on the ways of Chakra, it would have taken me many more years than it did to learn all that I now know. The clans told me of a technique called the Summoning Jutsu that by going through a certain series of hand seals allow us to summon them to our dimension and vice versa. All that is needed is a contract sealed in to mark our partnership. If one performs the hand seals and does not have a contract, they will instantly be summoned to the realm of the animal they have the greatest affinity to. I myself had written a contract with most, if not all the species, and am able to summon any of them at will. They also informed me that anyone possessing by Rinnegan will also have a contract with all the animal clans. There was one clan, however, that stood out among the rest. This species was known as the Bakemono, and they were one of the most powerful clans in existence. They had perfected mastering chakra to the point where they not only could manipulate the elements better than the strongest ninjutsu, but they possess a number of abilities that few humans could ever hope to match such as flight, lightning-like speeds, claws stronger than steel, the ability to become invisible to the naked eye, near mortality, and strength that few could match. It was with a certain Bakemono that I had formed a contract with, for unlike other summons, the Bakemono only do individual contract summons due to their belief in hunting alone. Also unlike other summons, the Bakemono can stay in this realm for an infinite amount of time while other summons must head back to their world after they are either called back or run out of chakra. This certain Bakemono decided to follow me because, in his own words, it would amuse me. We went on many adventures together that are further detailed in this scroll, including in his help in defeating and sealing the Jubai into me. As I am nearing the end of my life, my Bakemono friend suggests placing his contract into this scroll located at the bottom of this insert. All that is needed to activate it is a little to be smeared across and for chakra to be placed into it. There are also details on the hand seals required for the sealing next to it. The reason that I am telling you this is because the reason you have gotten this far into this chamber is because the sealing wards I have placed have deemed you pure of heart and worthy enough to carry out my mission after I am gone. To bring peace to this world, the Bakemono would most certainly help you in this but be warned, the Bakemono are a proud species and will most likely test you on your worthiness to work with them. He would most likely kill you if he finds you unworthy, so you can sign the contract at your own risk. Best of luck. The scroll went on, but Naruto ignored the rest in favor of staring at a seal placed dead center in the scroll just after the ending of the first insert. Right below it was a detailed description of the hand seals required, which were just like the ones Naruto learned in the academy. 
Naruto's mind was racing through different thoughts. His first thought was on how cool it was that he discovered an article from someone who shaped the ninja world into what it was today. Another was that he now realized that the scrolls and books filling the room were research scrolls the Sage of the Six Paths left behind, and that they undoubtedly held many secrets and awesome techniques he could use. Naruto's main thoughts were on the ceiling scroll before him though. Do I really want to sign this he mused, I mean it would be awesome to have such a cool summon like the Bakemono, but the sage says that this one would kill me if he doesn't find me worthy enough what should I do. Naruto thought about it for a grand total of three and a half minutes before he reached his decision. He was Naruto Uzumaki, future Hawkage of Kanoha if he was scared over something like this. How would he be able to become the village's strongest ninja he also reasoned that the Bakemono would accept him no problem thanks to how awesome he is so. Tossing caution to the wind, Naruto bit into his thumb and placed the across the seal, focusing his chakra into it like how Urukei-sensei taught him to open a ceiling scroll. There was a small poof of smoke and when it cleared there was another large scroll on top of the other one. He opened up the scroll and saw that you were supposed to place your name and handprint by comparing what the sage did, however the sage's name was mysteriously blotted out. After signing both his name and placing his Y handprint on the open space on the seal thanks to his still bleeding thumb, Naruto slowly went through the hand seals described on the other scroll so he wouldn't mess up. After he was certain he did them all correctly, he focused his chakra and yelled, summoning Jutsu. There was another, though much larger, puff of smoke that filled the room and as it cleared, Naruto could make out a shape taking form in the smoke. It was then that a deep growling voice called out to him, making him nearly have a heart attack for a second time that day. The voice said, Well this is a surprise, never thought another human would summon me to this world. Naruto gaped as the smoke caused by the summoning faded and the owner of the voice was revealed. The being before him was huge Naruto was fairly small for his age but he knew just by looking that the creature was at least a full foot taller than Urukei-sensei. At least seven feet in height the being was covered in burnt orange fur with black stripes running along his back, face, and arms. The Bakemono stood on two legs like a man, but its hind legs were shaped like most cats and dogs. Its arms had human-shaped hands that ended in knife-like claws that were at least a foot long, more than capable of slicing right through him like a loaf of bread Naruto also noticed a cat-like tail swishing behind the beast's back. Slightly darker orange hair hanged from its head all the way down its back and had a part right above the face that was a shocking white color. It was the beast's face though, that drew most of Naruto's attention. It had wide, pupilless eyes that seemed to glow with power and ferocity. The mouth was filled with razor-sharp teeth that could easily go through solid stone if it had to. What was interesting though was that depending how you looked at the face it looked a mix between animal and human. There was a muzzle, but it was smaller than a dog's and if you looked directly at the front it was almost non-existent. All in all, it was an awe-inspiring and frightening image to behold. Aruda was shook out of his trance-like state when the Bakemono spoke again in a deep, gravelly voice that indicated the being was male. Huh, so this is my new summoner a a lot smaller than my previous one that's for sure. Doubt you'd even be a mouthful of a snack. Despite the thing called common sense that was screaming at him to keep quiet, Naruto gained a tick mark on his head as he shouted at the monster. Don't call me little I'm not a runt, I just haven't hit my growth spurt yet and you're too tall anyway, idiot. The creature's eyes widened slightly before he gave a deep belly laugh and he reached down before picking Naruto up by the back of his shirt before bringing the boy to eye level. The beast glared at his summoner and growled out of course you're a runt a suicidal runt at that if y'all think talking to me like that's good for your health. Besides, what's a pipsqueak like you gonna do if I keep calling you that, Hooga? The monster was cut off mid-speech as Naruto's foot got introduced to his face, causing the beast to let go of the brat and clutch at his aching nose. He looked at the boy with tearful eyes and growled out, What was that for, you stupid brat though it sounded more like a whine. Quickly regaining his composure, the monster stood at his full intimidating height and gave a roar. Idiot mortal do you have any idea who I am I'm Lord Nagatabamaru, master of the Bakemono and slayer of both man and beast who do you think you are, huh? Naruto stared defiantly back at the yakai, his mind filled with stubborn determination. I'm Naruto Yuzumaki, future shinobi of the village hidden in the leaves, and I'll be the greatest hawkage there ever was, ya stupid cat. The now-named Nagatabamaru growled at the cat comment before calming his mind, refusing to let a little brat get a rise out of him. The beast looked at the boy with his white eyes and said, Despite your clear lack of respect, I'm guessing you're not a complete waste of my time if you were able to summon me. Tell me though, why in the hell should I work with you answer carefully brat, cause your next words could be your last. Although not the brightest person around, Naruto understood that he had somehow crossed the line when he summoned the beast. While not above being selfish, the boy's inherently good nature overcame his desire to somehow weasel his way out of the uncomfortable situation as he admitted, I just wanted to summon something, anything. Not satisfied by the boy's answer, Nagatabamaru demanded, for what? Looking as horribly dejected as he felt, the boy explained, to show everyone that I can be an awesome ninja like my idol, the fourth Hawkage, and to have a friend. The monster stared at him for a minute with a piercing stare, and Naruto shifted uncomfortably as those pure white orbs seemed to stare into his soul. Finally, Nagatabamaru sighed and said, All right, brat, I'll give you the benefit of a doubt, for now. Why clearly have some potential to be able to find this place and summon me of all beings. 
But know this, his voice became more growl-like. If for some reason, any reason at all, I find no reason to stick around, I'm off. And if you continue to tick me off, I just may have a snack before leaving. If you get my meaning, he said while flashing his sharp white teeth, causing Naruto to gulp. Now, the summon said, I'm gonna do a quick run through your mind, just to see what I'm working with. Naruto looked surprised, run through my mind how are you going to do that? Like this, Nagatabamaru stated before reaching out with one of his claws and placing it on the boy's forehead, causing both beings to freeze up and go still. Scene break. The tiger-like monster blinked as he found himself in a sewer-like background. Wrinkling his nose in disgust, the man-beast growled out, Man, what kind of crappy life does this kid life to have this for a mindscape going through the winding hole? The tiger found himself in front of a large room with an equally large cage at one end. Curious, the Bakemono moved over to the cage, walking on top of the water to do so, and found himself staring at a huge slumbering fox with nine waving tails. The smaller monster had an eyebrow and then said, Oh, what are you doing in T-Brat Kurama? The fox twitched at the voice and slowly woke up, stretching to his true, intimidating height. Then the fox growled out, Who dares disturb the great Kaiuha? It was then he noticed the other presence in the room. The fox's red eyes went comically wide and he did his best version of a bow he could do in the cage he was trapped in. The nine-tailed fox then stammered out, El Lord Nan Nagatabamaru, how have you been? I haven't seen you since before the old man died. How in the world did you get into the brat's mindscape? The humans didn't seal you in here too, did they? The tiger snickered at the fox's antics and then said, First of all, I've been fine except a bit bored over the millennia. Second of all, no I'm not sealed, just checking out the mind of my latest summoner. Lastly, how'd you get your furry but sealed into this brat? The cubai's mouth did an impressive impersonation of a goldfish as he gaped at the much smaller animal and stuttered, S summoner him but that's how did huh? As amused as I am by your smart conversation, this is getting a bit troublesome. The tiger grumbled before he faced through the bars of the seal and smacked the fox upside the head, causing the titan to go flying into the ceiling before coming down with a resounding crash after Kurama shook the dancing hippos out of his head. He then looked back at the tiger with a more respectable expression on his face. That's better. Nagatabamaru smirked and then told the fox how the blonde midget had found the hidden chamber of the Sage of the Six Paths and had found his summoning contract. Kurama, in turn, informed him of everything that has happened in the world since the summon had gone back to his realm. The Kubai got a tick mark as the tiger rolled around on the ground in hysterical laughter after being told about his run-in with the gold and silver brothers of Hidden Cloud. Nagatabamaru then gained a somber expression when Kurama told him about Madara Uchiha and Hashirama Senju's infamous struggle and how he got dragged into it, and about his next three imprisonments. After telling him of the events from his last release, the monster then gave a sigh. Well, this world sure has had some interesting things happen to it. Hanegatabamaru said as he cracked a pointed grin, It's been great catching up Kurama, especially since the last time I saw you, you were barely bigger than I was. Now I'm guessing the brat doesn't know about you yet then seeing the great fox shake his head. Nagatabamaru gave a nod and said, Well, I guess I'll leave your presence a secret for now, till the people responsible for the kid decide to tell him. Who knows, maybe I can properly introduce the two of you when the time is right. Noticing Kurama's disbelieving look the summon then said chidingly, Oh come on, give the kid a chance will ya I mean, if I can tolerate him surely you can. Anyway, well it's been great catching up and all I need to go through th kid's memories yet so I'll catch you around, k. Okay. With a wave of his clawed hand, the summon then went out of the ceiling chamber and proceeded to go through his summoner's memories. Nagatabamaru gave a growl as he saw how cold most of the villagers treated Naruto. But he then saw the select few that actually seemed to give a crap about the blonde while also noticing the boy's pally eat stalker and gave a snicker as he thought on all the fun he could have messing with the two till they noticed each other. The tiger then noticed the boy's determination and strength of will despite his life, and gave a satisfied nod as he decided he'd found a good summoner for now. Scene break. While it may have seemed like hours for the Bakemono, in truth only two seconds had passed in the real world. After he lowered his claw, the boy looked at the beast and asked, Is everything all right, Tora? The summon froze. What the hell do you call me? He asked in a dangerous voice. Naruto looked bashful. Well, I tried thinking of how to pronounce your name, but I kinda had a rough time with it, so I figured I'd call you Tora for short, cause you look kinda like a tiger. The now dubbed Tora gave an exasperated sigh. Why'd I have to get such an idiot as a summoner ignoring the boy's indignant look he continued? Well good news for you brat is that I've deemed you worthy of being the summoner of my awesome self so be grateful. I'll teach you everything that y'all need to know but don't think I'll go easy on you. He gave a fang smirk to the now pale blonde. After all, if you're gonna be my summoner that means you're going to be representing me, and I can't have a weakling as a summoner now can I any questions? Just one. How do we get out of here? asked Naruto as he noticed they were still in the chamber with no visible way out. Tora snorted and said, that's easy enough. Climb on my back brat, and if you make so much as one horse comment I swear to god I'll eat you feet first. The blonde gulped again and climbed onto his new summons' his back. The tiger then shot into the air, much to Naruto's shock, and phased right through the roof as if it wasn't there at all. Thus begins a beautiful friendship.
Ouch, watch the hair, you idiot. Or not. Naruto was snoozing contently on his bed, sprawled so that half his body was sticking out of the covers and had a bit of drool coming out of the side of his grinning mouth while he dreamed of opening the world's first all-you-can-eat ramen bar. The sun had started peeking through the window, casting an ominous shadow over the blonde sleeping figure. Suddenly, Naruto awoke to a sense of foreboding and immediately rolled out of the way, just as four claw-shaped marks appeared on the pillow right where his head was not a minute ago. W what the crap Naruto shouted as he untangled himself from the floor where he crashed after the near-death experience. It was then he noticed the tall tiger-like figure crouching on his bed with an amused grin on its beastly face. What's the big idea Tora Naruto barked out angrily as he got to his feet while keeping his eyes on his new summon, Mentor. The previous day, after the Bekmono summon got the duo out of the underground temple, Naruto had directed Tora to his apartment. While initially worried on how other people might react to the large summon's presence, the tiger informed the seven-year-old that unless he wanted people to see him, his presence would be all but invisible to the naked eye. As it was getting late, Naruto offered Tora to sleep on his couch until he could afford a guest bed but the summon refused, saying he'd prefer sleeping on the roof as opposed to sleeping in a, and I quote, monkey-smelling concrete cage. The boy bid his new friend goodnight but was promised to experience training from hell the next day. Back to the attempted murder. It's quite simple brat, Tora informed his summoner with a fang smirk. Since you want to be a ninja so bad I'm going to teach you all the tools you need to survive until I no longer deem necessary. That was simply lesson number one, situational awareness. From now on I'll be launching sneak attacks on you at any given time until you can avoid me without even thinking about it. Are you crazy you nearly killed me with that attack Naruto bit back irritably, cranky both from the attack and the fact that it was the crack of dawn. Oh please, if I wanted to kill you, you'd be dead before even the Shinigami realized it. Tora growled back before gaining a sadistic smile on his face and said in a creepy sing-song voice. And now for lesson number two, try to avoid me for the next hour he roared the last part as he leapt at his summoner, claws and fangs bared. It was going to be a long morning. Time skip. Fortunately for Naruto, it was the weekend so he didn't have to worry about explaining to Urukase and say why he was covered in painful scratch marks and one or two bite marks. He huffed as he prepared a bowel of instant ramen and waited for the agonizing three minutes before his breakfast was done. Tora was watching him in a semi-bored state as he idly had the stray off his claws. You know, the summon began. I may not be an expert on human anatomy or nothing but shouldn't you try having something better for you than noodles so early in the morning you're going to need your strength breath for the training I plan on putting you through. Ignoring the shiver that ran down his spine at the mention of more training, Naruto simply said, I know I could probably eat better, but ramen is the best I can afford with my budget that I can get from old man Hawkage until I can start taking missions of my own. Besides, at this Naruto grinned, ramen is too good of a food to pass up. Tora simply shrugged his furry shoulders and said, makes no difference to me. However, if you'd be interested I can share a tip or two about hunting and gathering food. Can't have my summoner keeling over cause of poor food choices now can I. Naruto turned and gave a big grin. I'd like that, he said sincerely, since those skills would undoubtedly be useful for whenever he became a real ninja and was required to take long-term missions outside the village. Plus he was grateful for all of the help the tiger-like summon has offered him so far. Now, would you like to try some ramen Naruto asked as he prepared a bowel of his own. Hey, why not, Tora said with another shrug. Naruto poured another bowel of the ramen and set it before his new sensei and the tiger carelessly picked up the entire bowel and chugged the whole thing in one go. After letting out a satisfied belch and picking his teeth with a clawed finger he said, M.M., not bad. Not really the same as meat but passable. Naruto was happy that the summon liked the ramen, but of course he really wished that he didn't downplay God's gift to mankind like that taking a deep breath and trying to count backwards from ten to calm himself. Naruto said, so Tori sensei where are we going to train at? HMPH, should call me Lord Tor at least, the Bakemono mumbled loud enough for Naruto to hear and then said in a normal tone, well brat, since you're so eager why don't we go there now before the blonde could even comment or question his teacher he found himself being yanked up into the air by Tora's long mane of hair that acted as a lasso and found himself being dragged out of his apartment's open window into the morning sky. While this was happening, Naruto was frantically trying to eat his ramen that he was able to snag from the table while hanging upside down and trying not to spill any. Time skip. Naruto found himself dangling above a vast amount of forest, still being held around the ankle by his summon's hair. Um, Tori sensei what are we doing here? This is where you'll be training at for the next 48 hours brat, the silvery tiger said smugly, I took the liberty of looking for the best place for your survival training and this seems to be the best. In truth he'd listened in on a conversation carried on by two drunken Jonin walking by Naruto's apartment the previous evening and they were saying how training ground 44 was going to start being used in the Chunin exams from now on and how they couldn't believe they'd send kids into the forest of death of all places. Intrigued, Tora went to check out the fabled training grounds and was satisfied that it would serve as good survival training for his new charge. For now though, try and stay alive Tora shouted out as his hair unwrapped itself from the boy's ankle. A Naruto was able to gasp out before he was unceremoniously dropped 20 feet onto the forest floor right on his bum. 
Grumbling as he stood up while rubbing his abused rear end, Naruto had looked up and was about to curse out the summon before he heard an ominous growl to his left. Hesitantly, Naruto turned to look at the source of the noise and noticed three huge regular tigers looking at him like he was a juicy steak. Gulping audibly, Naruto slowly backed away while stammering out, Unas Kittis. The tiger simply roared and started to give chase to the easy meal. Naruto gave off a very manly scream and ran for his life, the tigers in hot pursuit. Meanwhile, still floating above the canopy in a reclined position with his arms resting behind his shaggy head, Tora gave a rumbling laugh as he watched his blonde brat's life or death struggle. Little did the brat know that he had come upon the tiger den during his visit the previous evening and, due to his obvious affinity towards the large cats, was able to convince them to help out with this little I mean training exercise. The native tigers would chase his charge until he looked ready to collapse and then come back and begin the chase anew every few hours. This would hopefully build up the blonde's endurance and survival instincts as well as making him stronger. And if things got to rough, the tigers had orders to back off and if possible help the blonde idiot. But there was no need to tell him that now was there. Hearing another manly scream echo through the forest, followed by the roars of several tigers, Tora smirked to himself. Perhaps he'd use this 48-hour period to further requaint himself with the brat's village. After all, his summoner seemed to have his hands full at the moment. For Naruto, it was going to be a long, long, luang two days. And the best part was, he had school to go to right after this was just not his day. Good morning, Klai and Aruto. What happened a scarred Chunin teacher named Uruka greeted, then shouted at his class on Monday. The class turned to look at their blonde-haired peer and couldn't help but stare. Naruto looked like he received the worst of a cat mauling, minefield, and mud run all at once his clothes were splattered with mud and some dried and had jagged tears everywhere. His face was covered in scratches and it looked like he had a black eye and was missing a baby tooth. All in all, Naruto looked like death worn over. Chuckling sheepishly until he had to hold on to his still tender ribs, Naruto said abashedly, Would you believe me if I told you I slipped and fell? The entire class sweat dropped at this in Uruka side while pinching the bridge of his scarred nose. If the blonde could joke about his condition and come to class, then it obviously looked worse than it did. Eyeing the whiskered child, Uruka said, Just take a seat, Naruto, and go see the nurse after class. Naruto nodded while going to gingerly sit down in the back of the class. While he normally was one for attention, this wasn't the kind he had in mind and would rather stay in the backs of everyone's minds for now. Also, it gave him plenty of opportunities to speak to his new furry friend. Tora was perched idly on Naruto's shoulder, feeling significantly lighter than what his large form suggests. No one paid the tiger-like summon any mind, since he'd made himself all but invisible to anyone who wasn't his summoner. Late last evening, Tora had decided Naruto had enough training for the weekend and picked him up from the forest of death. The past two days for Naruto had been, for lack of a better term, hell. The giant tigers had been relentless in their pursuit of the young blonde, and if that wasn't enough there was giant leeches, poisonous plants and animals, as well as quicksand pits to look out for. To say Naruto was surprised to be alive when Tora showed up and hauled him back home was like saying Kakashi liked reading smut, a huge understatement. He'd been covered with even more wounds that night and collapsed on the bed in pure exhaustion, after thoroughly cursing Tora out, and didn't even have the strength left to change his torn and dirty clothes. Naruto awoke with a start that morning and had to rush to class after grabbing a quick bite at Ikarakus. Naruto sent a silent glare at his orange-furred companion who was chuckling still at his disheveled appearance. While he knew he couldn't match the summon physically, Naruto swore on all higher powers that he'd prank the ever-living daylights out of the tiger as soon as he got the chance. Haruka started on to the day's lecture on the Second Shinobi War, which Naruto soon started to lose focus on until he felt a sharp pinch on his cheek. Trying not to yelp and with tears in his eyes, Naruto stared up at Tora in both anger and confusion. The powerful summon gave a glare with his pale eyes and whispered harshly, Pay attention Brad I refuse to have an idiot as my summoner, so if I have to I'll force you to focus through every lesson until you get it through that thick skull of yours to listen. Naruto gulped and meekly nodded while turning his attention back to Uruke Sensei. No point arguing with a large tiger who could easily eat you, or worse increase his insane training regime even more after several hours of being forced to listen. Naruto sat on one of the benches provided by the academy for lunch breaks with a groan. This one was hidden by trees and bushes to give the blonde some privacy so he could talk to Tora. Not only were the lessons dull and boring, but Tora kept pinching him with his sharp claws every time it looked like his attention was wavering fortunately by this point. Naruto's advanced healing had done its miracles on his body and the scratches and bruises were all but non-existent, it was just the exhaustion that remained. Naruto received a chill as he felt Tora leer down on him from the tree branch perched above his seat. Constant vigilance, Brat the tiger summon roared as he leapt down at his blonde-haired student with his claws extended. Naruto managed to roll out of the way in time as the bakemono crashed into the ground right in front of him with a swipe to the chest. Without thinking, Naruto's newly honed instincts made him grab one of the practice kunai he kept in his supply pouch and tossed it at the white-eyed tiger. The blade actually hit true and sunk into Tora's hand. They both stared at the blade for a few awkward seconds before Tora responded. Y-E-O-W-C-H he hollered as he danced around comically with the blade sticking out of his hand. 
Realizing what he was doing, Tor quickly tried to compose himself and save what dignity he had left by pulling the blade out of his paw and turned towards Naruto with his throbbing hand clasped behind his back. Nicely done, brat, Tora complimented in what he hoped was a casual tone. Your reflexes have improved nicely. Naruto bashfully rubbed the back of his head with a grin on his face before he gained a confused expression. I'm actually surprised I made that. I'm usually the worst shot in the class, yet I was able to hit the bullseye while on the move too. Tora grimaced as he thought of his aching hand as a bullseye but gave a sagely nod of his head and explained, It's not really surprising when you think about it. That training I've put you through wasn't just for fun, you know Naruto gave a sour look as that training had been far from fun, you've been hardening your reflexes by surviving both my sneak attacks and all that survival training in the forest. With increased reflexes comes increased hand-eye coordination as well as a stronger mind and body. In a few more months, I wouldn't be surprised if you were on the same level, if not higher than, your peers. Naruto gave his summon a grateful smile and went back to the table to start eating his lunch before class started back up. Tora decided to go back up the tree he was on and lounge lazily among the branches while enjoying the afternoon sun soaking his fur in warmth. Suddenly, his sensitive ears picked up movement in the nearby bushes. Looking over with his white eyes, Tora noticed a young human girl peering through the bushes to watch his equally young summoner. The girl's hair was a dark indigo color till it was nearly black, she wore a baggy jacket over her small frame, and her skin was a pale color that nearly matched her eyes. By Kugan, H.M. Tora mused as he observed the girl. Seeing those pale white eyes caused the Bakemono to think back to when his kind first roamed this world and met the first chakra user. She was a beautiful woman named Kaguya Atsutsuki, the one who ate from the Shinju to help end the wars over the land. Tora's clan, who inhabited the world at the time, found out about a human learning chakra and sought her out. Thinking her capable of bringing peace to the world, Tora's people taught her how to properly use it, since only animals had any real understanding of chakra. Eventually, she developed eyes similar to the Bakemono, and it was called the Bayakugan. Later, she had two sons, Hagoromo and Hemura, who inherited her strong chakra and their own eye techniques. Hagoromo inherited the Rinnegan while Hemura gained the Bayakugan. It was around this time, however, that Kaguya became corrupted by the power she had, as those with too much power tend to do. By using the powers given to her by the Shinju, she became a being of immense power and destruction known as the Jubai, or Ten Tails, and set out to reclaim the chakra she deemed as hers, namely that which her sons inherited. Knowing that the children, who were young men at this point, needed help to defeat the power-hungry demoness, Tora and his people lent their aid to the two brothers. Teaching them all they knew about chakra, the brothers and the Bakemonos went to fight the Jubai. The battle was intense, to say the least. While the brothers, Tora, and his people were all strong in their own right, the Jubai's power was on a completely different level. Finally, the brothers succeeded by sealing away Kaguya's consciousness, while Hagoromo sealed the Jubai's chakra into his own body. Tora himself was one of the few survivors of his clan, and vowed to watch over the two brothers to make sure they didn't make the same mistakes as their mother. It turns out that he needn't worry, however. Both brothers seemed to have the world's best interest in mind, and worked hard to help the lives of the people who lived there. As time went on, Hagoromo had two sons, Indara and Ashura. Later, as it came time for Hagoromo to pass from this world, he took the chakra from the Jubai that he sealed and created nine entities known as the Biju, or Tailed Beasts. He then spoke with Tora and asked the tiger monster to return to his realm until the time came when someone worthy as his successor was to summon him. That was the last time Tora was in this world, yet he made sure to hear the news of the world from other summons who went to the human world from time to time. Snapping out of his reminiscence, Tora looked back at the young girl with the Bayakugan, whom he assumed was a descendant of Hemura. The girl seemed to be looking at his summoner with a shy look of longing, as if she wanted to go speak to the boy but was too nervous to gather up the courage to go into the clearing. Looks like she's got a crush on the brat, huh? Tora thought idly before a mischievous grin worked its way onto his fang mouth. Gently floating down behind the hiding girl, Tora placed his hand on her back and gave a push. The push was enough to send the girl stumbling into the clearing with Naruto in it with a surprise deep. Naruto said dumbly as he saw the pale-eyed girl stumble into the clearing. Noticing that the girl fell over, Naruto quickly went over to see if she was all right, never noticing the mane of orange hair poking above the bushes before it quickly disappeared into the trees. Are you all right? He asked in concern while gently propping the girl into a more comfortable sitting position. Unbeknownst to Naruto, said girl was blushing up a storm and was going through a mental tirade at the moment. And Naruto's tea talking to him M.E.O. He yeah, must think I'm such a cake klutz W. What do I S.A. W. What do I D.D.O. The pale-eyed girl thought frantically. Hey, are you okay? Your face is getting all red and stuff. Naruto asked as he placed the back of his hand against the girl's head as he'd seen mothers do to their children to see if they had a fever. Hinata, startled by the contact and her already raging emotions, did what any shy girl in her position would do. She fainted. Naruto immediately panicked and worried about what to do while Tora lounged in one of the branches of the trees, laughing his furry head off. Seems like life as the brat summon wouldn't be so dull after all. 
the sun started to shine through the cracks in the shutters of a window. Light crept through the room until it fell onto a bed, showing the room's lone occupant fast asleep. Suddenly, a shadow slinked closer and closer until it was right on top of the bed. Tora smirked as he readied his claws. It was time for Naruto to wake up. Before the tiger could do anything, however, Naruto's eyes snapped open and with a determined yell, leaped up from his lying position to give a dropkick right to Tora's chest. The summon gave a surprised oof before tumbling off the bed clutching his chest. And now nine-year-old Naruto stood on his bed victoriously, glad to have caught his tormentor, friend, summoned before he could perform the daily ritual of wake up and dodge. Ha got you, ya jerk Naruto cheered in triumph as he jumped off the bed and aimed a downward kick towards the still recovering Tora. Before he could complete the attack, however, his leg was caught by a large and clawed fur-covered hand. Heh, not bad brat, but don't get why Tora roared as he flung his summoner around like a sack of potatoes before letting him slam into the opposing wall with a bang. Naruto groaned as he slid down, a noticeable bump the size of a base forming on the back of his head. Ah jeez, why can't I beat you even after two years Naruto complained as he picked himself off of the ground brushing himself off. It goes to show how much the blonde's endurance has increased, as that would have left him out of commission for at least an hour back when he first met Tora. Fat chance on that kid. You could study for a thousand years and not even reach the very minimum of my strength, Tora bragged. Though not for a lack of trying, mind you, he thought as he turned his back to Naruto and rubbed his still aching ribs. The protein just rolled his eyes and stretched, the sun now fully lighting the room. Tora was just the same as he was when he was first summoned, shaggy orange fur with black stripes, silver eyes, and razor teeth and claws. It was Naruto, however, who should the most change over the last few years. Whereas before he was one of the shorter members of his class, he had grown to a decent height of nearly 4 foot 8. He also had a more muscular physique now, not to the point where he was bulky but more along gymnast, runner build. Tora accredited this to both the insane tour training he put the boy through on a daily basis for the last couple years, as well an improved diet ever since Tora taught Naruto how to both hunt and forage for food. Now he only ate ramen every so often for pleasure. Naruto's hair was also longer and shaggier, looking slightly more like Tora's now. It was the look in Naruto's eyes that really changed though. While they still held that playful mischievous look in them, they also showed a sense of alertness that most children lacked, as if he was prepared for any and all eventualities. They also showed something Naruto desperately wanted as a child, a true sense of happiness. Thanks to Tora's teachings, Naruto had been able to walk tall and proud these last few years, and he found making friends a much easier task than he did previously. Sure he still played pranks and was a lovable goof most of the time, but now he had a sense about him that one gets when faced with a stronger being one that demands respect and obedience. After completing the morning rituals, we find Naruto jumping from the rooftops on his way to the academy with Tora lazily flying beside him. You seem happy today, the tiger noted. Naruto just grinned as he leapt to a nearby rooftop. Of course I am, Tora we're doing spars again today and I want to show everyone the taijutsu I've been working on. As the months went by, Tora pointed out to the blonde that the academy's standard forms didn't seem to work all that well with him. When Naruto asked the summon what he should do, the ancient being's response was as blunt as always, figure out your own style, moron. After that, Naruto had worked on a fighting style that seemed to fit him best. Finally, after nearly three years of working on it, the style was, as Tora put it, not a complete piece of crap, which is as high a praise as one could expect from the tactless summon. Tora just gave a faint smirk at his summoner's enthusiasm. Well, here's hoping that you didn't just waste these last two years working on it then, he commented snidely. Naruto just rolled his eyes at the beast's encouragement and started to go to the door of the academy that he'd just arrived at. Before entering, Tora leapt up onto Naruto's shoulder, looking like a demented image of a parrot. The two entered the classroom where the other students started settling down, Tora going unnoticed thanks to his abilities. Spotting a familiar head of bluish-black hair, Naruto grinned and called out to his friend, Hey Hinata. Said girl gave a slight jump but controlled herself, looking over to the boy she had a crush on. Hey hello Naruto, she said slightly timidly, but not nearly as bad as two years ago. After the event and the clearing back when Naruto was seven, the Jinchuriki quickly took the fainted girl to the nurse's office and stayed by her side till she awoke. After greeting the young heiress back to the world of the living, Naruto was able to start talking to the girl. Naturally Naruto, thick-headed that he was, figured that the strange, pallid girl might have been interested in training with him and that was why she was in the clearing, and asked her if she would be interested in coming to train with him sometime. He was fortunate that Hinata was currently in a bed at that time, otherwise she would have fallen over at that. Gathering every fiber of the minimal courage that resided in her body, Hanada was able to squeak out a yes. Tora, of course, just watched the whole thing from the window, chuckling at the two children's antics. As time went on, it turned out the two were good sparing partners for each other. With her gentle fist attacks, Hinata gave Naruto a good way to work on both his dodging and endurance while Naruto's never-give-up attitude not only helped Hinata work on her own endurance, but it also gave her more confidence in battle. While she was no Amazon, she was still able to dish out and take some punishment now. The two had grown to be close friends over the years and spend any free time hanging out. 
Surprisingly, the Hewlett clan didn't seem to raise a big stink over this, possible because it was noticed that Anata had started to improve as an individual ever since she started being around Naruto more. The only problem was that on occasion, like when Naruto would take off his shirt after a spar, Hinata would still get extremely red and sometimes pass out. Naruto had asked Tora about this, but the Bakemono just laughed. Jerk. Back to the classroom, Naruto sat down beside the heiress as Urukai-sensei and Mizuki-sensei walked in. For some reason, Tora didn't seem to like Mizuki because he rubbed him the wrong way and always took the time to make the chunin miserable. From slashing the back of his pants when he wasn't looking to tying his shoelaces together so he'd trip when he walked. Tora didn't seem to mind Uruka though, so the mysterious invisible prankster didn't strike against him. Uruka cleared his throat, trying to get the student's attention. When that didn't work, he coughed louder but still the kids carried on with what they were doing. Uruka took in a deep breath of air, and Tora covered his long ears with his hands. Uruka's head seemed to grow to three times its normal size as he yelled, Sit down and shut up, you brats. Like throwing a switch, everything went silent as the class sat still in their seats, looking at the now normal Uruka. I still can't figure out how he does that, Tora mused as he took his hands away from his sensitive ears. Good morning class, today we will be holding our weekly spars to see how you all have improved. If you'll follow me and Mizuki, we will head out to the sparring arena, Uruka announced while standing up. With that, the two chunin waited as the students lined up before heading to the circular ring set up in the backyard of the academy. Once everyone was accounted for, Haruka gave an encouraging smile and said, All right, please wait for us to call your names and step into the ring with your partners. The standard rules apply, just remember to use the seal of reconciliation afterwards. Up first is. This went on for several minutes as the children were called up to do their spars. Some did well, others average, and others still did terribly. This got rather monotonous after a while as Naruto's attention started to waver. He idly noticed Tora was lounging on the rooftop of the academy, seemingly asleep but Naruto knew from experience that he was alert and ready to move at a moment's notice. Finally his name was called, along with Sasuke Uchiha, the class prodigy. Naruto gave a grin at this and got into the ring with Sasuke following soon afterwards with his tough bad boy look, which caused most of the girls in the class to squeal and cheer him on. Normally, Naruto would be nervous about this fight seeing as whenever they previously fought, Sasuke would always have Naruto in dirt. This time, however, Naruto knew his completed fighting style would give him the edge he needed. As Sasuke slipped into his clan's fighting stance, Naruto slid into a stance that wasn't recognized by neither the students nor the faculty. He stood upright with his left leg slightly behind him and his arms held at his side with a slight angle, giving the impression that he was leaving himself wide open. Sasuke seemed puzzled by this momentarily but shrugged it off. Once the signal to begin was giving, the last Uchiha shot forward at near blurring speeds, but Naruto stood in place. When he got closer, Sasuke shot a fist out intent on going for Naruto's face but before it could make contact, Naruto shot his left arm out and actually managed to swat the incoming fist away. Sasuke blinked at that but quickly changed tactics, using the momentum from the block to bring his leg up for a kick. However, Naruto's right arm shot out and actually managed to grab the other boy's leg. Using some impressive maneuvering, Naruto turned the grab into a grapple, forcing Sasuke onto his back while Naruto held onto the leg while simultaneously getting behind the downed boy, preventing him from getting up. Sasuke growled in irritation as he tried to use his other leg to donk kick the blonde, but Naruto was able to use his own legs to wrap around the incoming limb while his left arm grabbed Sasuke by the right shoulder and pinned the arm along his back, turning them into some kind of human pretzel. Sasuke struggled to break free but then Naruto pulled his head back and gave a headbutt to the dark-haired child. This didn't knock him out, but it was enough to daze him and Naruto used that to roll Sasuke onto his stomach, successfully pinning him. Uruka blinked at the vastly improved display from one of his favorite students before realizing that there wasn't any way for Sasuke to get up, thus allowing him to call the match in Naruto's favor. Naruto grinned as he got up. It looks like his new style worked well after all. Due to his constant spars with Tora, Naruto came to the realization that he couldn't full-on fight the more powerful opponent, especially with Tora's superior size, strength, and sharp claws. He then came up with the idea for a style that focused more on deflection and grappling using unpredictable movements, which allowed him to successfully get around Tora's unstoppable offense. The swiping movements were partially inspired by Tora, as the tiger's powerful swipes were easily able to block his attacks while at the same time having the potential to give damage. Naruto would still lose to the summon though due to Tora simply overpowering him, but this gave him the insight on how to use it on unsuspecting opponents who were anticipating him to go for a full-on charge. Tora also commented that it would be ideal for fighting armed opponents, as most weapons had a frontal assault that the swiping motions could easily block. Naruto brushed off the dust on the bottom of his pants while idly noting the silence in the area. Looking up, Naruto noticed most of the spectators were watching in stunned silence as the dead last just whooped the top of the class. Others were looking like they'd kill him while he slept, namely Sasuke's fans. Finally, there were those who were looking at him in interest, namely Hinata, Skikamaru, and possibly Shino. Haruka then spoke up, causing Naruto's attention to go back to his teacher. That was a well-fought battle. 
Now if you'll both do the seal of reconciliation, he said expectantly. Naruto gave a smile to the now standing Sasuke as he held two of his fingers out. The dark-haired boy, despite looking a little dusty, had largely shaken off the effects of the headbutt and was frowning at the smiling blonde. Reluctantly putting two of his fingers out to form the seal, Naruto swore he heard Sasuke mutter, how'd he get so strong? The two then exited the ring as the silence finally broke amongst the crowd as the students started to gossip excitedly about what just happened. Later that day, the academy was letting out for the day and Naruto was walking Hinata home. So what do you think those girls' problem was Naruto asked idly as they walked. For some reason unknown to the boy, the majority of the girls in the academy had given him the cold shoulder for the rest of the day. While getting glared it wasn't anything new to the boy, the sudden increase of hostility made him uneasy. Two think they must be upset about your win against Sasuke, Hinata told her crush honestly. She was truthfully irritated about the girl's response to the loss their object of affection suffered. Did she give any of the other students the cold shoulder when they beat Naruto? No. Even if she was upset she'd never do that? That was silly to do for a simple sparing match. Oh that stupid exclaimed Naruto, apparently agreeing with the girl's thoughts without her saying anything. I know it is, but they'll hopefully get over it with time, Hinata said optimistically. After all, you've just proven that you're getting much better so you can't be called the dead last anymore. Yeah I hope so, thanks, Naruto nodded in agreement. It was then they reached the front of the Hyuga estate. Well, here we are. See you tomorrow, Hinata Naruto asked. Giving a small smile, Hinata said, I would like that. In a display completely out of character for her, Hinata reached over and gave Naruto a quick hug. It was so quick that you might have missed it if you blinked, but it was there. Afterwards, Naruto had an expression of complete and utter surprise on his face while Hinata's looked somewhat like a tomato with how red it was, before she went running into the compound at speeds that would have made the current rakage jealous. Naruto stood stock still for a few minutes, until a rumbling chuckle snapped him out of his daze. Turning around, Naruto found Tora perched on top of a streetlight looking highly amused. Well, 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 aren't we on top of the world today? He grinned through a fang smirk. A light shade of pink mixed with the whisker marks as Naruto turned away while stammering out, Two have no idea what you're talking about, dumb tiger. Giving another laugh, Tora leapt form the streetlight and landed right beside the boy with cat-like grace. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. You're just too stupid to realize it yet anyway, great job today brat. You've proven that your physical aspects don't as hard as when we first met. Now all we need to do is work more on the chakra portions. You better be ready, because the hell I'm planning will make what we've done previously seem like a cakewalk with that. Tora shot into the air and soared over to where Naruto's apartment was, cackling all the while. Stupid summon, Naruto muttered under his breath as he started walking towards his home, wondering about the hug, his victory that day, and Tora's words. It was when he thought about the last one was when he stopped walking and lost all color in his face. Why I ate a second what did he mean by a cakewalk Tora you sadist. You get your furry butt back here right now and tell me what you have planned Naruto hollered as he raced towards the apartment with plans of forcing his troublesome summon on what tortures he had planned for the boy. A 12-year-old Naruto sat on top of the fourth's head at the Hawkage Monument doing something that would make most people believe they were hallucinating. He was in a meditative position and was sitting absolutely still for over five minutes. As time moved on, a change could be seen overtaking Naruto. His spiky blonde hair started to grow out until it flowed down his back while on his face his whisker marks thickened until they represented tiger stripes while his exposed arms also gained tiger-like stripes. Despite the change, Naruto seemed completely at ease. That changed after a few moments though, as Naruto's nails lengthened into claws while his teeth poked out of his lips into razor-sharp fangs. As orange fur started to join the black stripes as it sprouted on his arms and face. Before the transformation could progress, however, Tora materialized on Naruto's shoulder and bonked a clawed fist on the boy's head. Naruto yelped as he fell back nursing a lump on his head, his animalistic traits fading as fast as they appeared. Looking up, Naruto saw Tora standing at his full intimidating height with his arms crossed. HMPH, still not their breath. Maybe Tiger Sage mode is too far out of your reach, HM the summon sneered. Grumbling, Naruto got off the ground and glared at the tiger. Give me a break Tora sitting still too long is boring plus, I was able to get closer that time, I could feel it Naruto snapped at his summon. You also got closer to becoming a stone statue as well while I might find you annoying. Death through training isn't exactly how I'd want to see you kick the bucket, Tora snapped right back. Groaning, Naruto put his hands behind his head and started to head to the village with Tora floating behind him. Anyways I'm beat, and I gotta get set for the exam tomorrow, Naruto said as they departed the monument. You sure you've got it down this time Brad I'd hate to see you flop horribly, no matter how hilarious it may be, Tora gave a fang smirk. Instead of exploding like his younger self would have Naruto snorted, yeah I bet you'd like that. Anyway, with all the training I've been doing I'm sure I'm gonna pass. Then I'll be one step closer to becoming Hawkage, believe it. Heh, you better. I'm one of the most powerful summons out there, and it would only make sense if my summoner is a little bit stronger than the rest of the ants you call humans, Tora boasted while lightly landing on Naruto's shoulder. Rolling his eyes, Naruto quipped, better watch the ego Tora. If your head gets any bigger, I don't know how much my poor shoulder can take. The blonde started to laugh which turned into another yelp as Tora once more tried to brain him. 
This soon turned into a quick slugfist which, as always, ended with Tora on top of Naruto, and the blonde's face planted firmly in the dirt. After brushing himself off, the two continued the rest of the way back to Naruto's apartment in silence. As Naruto got ready for bed, Tora asked, Say Blondie, what were those tags you were planting on the monument before the training today anyway? Naruto grinned as he pulled on his nightshirt. Ah, uh, yeah, saw that. How well I figured since I'm graduating tomorrow, I probably won't be able to do any real pranks for a while. So I set those tags up for tomorrow to give me a nice big send-off the best thing is. It'll be set off on a timer so there's no way they can link me to it even though they'll all know it was me Naruto cackled like a mad genius while Tora simply smirked at his summoner's antics and hopped up onto his place on the roof to sleep. Morning. The early risers of Kanoha had woken up and had started their daily rituals. One merchant was unpacking his cart full of wares while a mail carrier went from mailbox to mailbox with the latest news. Suddenly though, a loud boom roared through the village, frightening those who were awake and startling the rest of the village out of their slumber. Fearing an enemy attack, the village guard quickly looked around for anything amiss. One by one, all attention was slowly brought to the Hawkage Monument, which left the villagers gaping. Each of the four stone faces were now covered in graffiti some of the hawkage had childish scribbles on them while others had rude words written on them. One thing they all had in common though was the whisker marks and tiger stripes painted on their faces. Finally, in the space next to the fourth's head was written, reserved for the most awesomest hawkage ever. Only one person would be seeing Juvenile to pull this off and everyone said it at once, N-A-R-U-T-O. Academy. Naruto snickered as the rest of the class glared at him. The entire village knew that he was responsible for this latest act of vandalism, but couldn't pin it on him since the timer seals that had been used to hold the paint were homemade and were destroyed in the explosion. Plus, when the Ambu went looking for the whiskered child they found him sound asleep in his bed with not a speck of paint to be found in his apartment. Meanwhile, a certain tiger summon was laughing his furry head off at the spectacle of the village that morning, and was still chuckling as he sat on his summoner's shoulder in his invisible mode. Back in class, both Uruka and Mizuki got ready to do the exams for the students. Today many of you will be starting off on the next step of your journey to become ninjas of the hidden leaf, Uruka explained to his class as he and Mizuki prepared the written portion of the exam. The journey ahead of you will be long and at times dangerous, but I'm confident each and every one of you will do the leaf proud. Naruto grinned as he looked over the exam. While written tests weren't his strong suit, Tora had convinced it into his head that a strong mind is just as important as a strong body to a warrior. After the hour was up and the papers were turned in, it was time for the ninjutsu portion of the exam. One by one the students were called, with Naruto giving each of his friends a nod of encouragement to which they all returned, though Hinata did look quite red when she went into the exam room. Naruto hoped that it wasn't her nerves about the exam. When his name was finally called, Naruto bounded into the exam room with a large grin. Prepare to be blown away by my awesomeness Naruto declared as he stood confidently in front of Uruka and Mizuki. The two chunin rolled their eyes at the blonde's antics and Uruka looked at him while saying, All right Naruto, it's time to do the three necessary jutsu. Are you ready? Seeing his whiskered student nod, Uruka continued, The first thing we need to try is the replacement jutsu. You need to replace yourself with one of the logs along the back of the room when one of us. The scarred chunin was cut off as Mizuki chucked a blunted kunai at the boy, who disappeared in a puff of smoke to be replaced by a log. The boy himself was along the back wall of the room, throws an object at you randomly. Uruka finished, giving an approved nod at Naruto's reaction time. Next is the transformation jutsu. Transform into the first thing you think of whenever you're ready. Naruto gave a mischievous grin at this that put both teachers on edge. Putting his hands together in the necessary sign, Naruto shouted out, transform and a puff of smoke once more surrounded the boy. However, when the smoke cleared instead of Naruto or a log, there stood a gorgeous blonde woman who had her long hair pulled into pigtails and had cute whisker marks on both cheeks. It was then the Chunin noticed that besides the few wisps of smoke in key areas, the girl was entirely naked both Uruka and Mizuki gave deep blushes as their eyes bulged out of their heads. This only lasted for a moment though, as both men were sent crashing into the opposite wall via the torrential nosebleed they both got. The blonde goddess disappeared in another puff of smoke to reveal a laughing Naruto who was cracking up at the results of his self-made attack, the Y jutsu it was a technique he came up with and, due to its hilarity, Tora approved of it. Unseen by all except Naruto, Tora was also lodging at the two Chunin's misfortune. He thought, heh, I'm surprised that worked on that gray-haired human. I always thought he swung the other way. After a minute or two, both teachers were able to pick themselves off the ground, curiously already having wads of tissue shoved up their nostrils. Enough of your stupid jutsu Uruka roared in embarrassment as Mizuki sat down with a blush still on his face, though this was of humiliation. Giggling, Naruto was able to compose himself enough to do the transformation again, though this time of Uruka. Giving a cough, the scarred Chunin said, now that's better. Finally, you have to do the clone jutsu and you'll be set. 
Um, Sensei, I've been having trouble with the standard clones because I'm told I have too much chakra, so I've been practicing around and was able to find an alternate version of the jutsu. Will that be okay? Uruka paused for a moment and looked at Mizuki, who just looked confused. Well, if it works as well as the clone jutsu I don't see why not. Show us what you can do, he consented. Nodding, Naruto plucked three strands of his hair from his head and shouted, Hidden Tiger Clone Jutsu and blew on the hairs. Smoke enveloped them and as it cleared, three Narutos were now standing in the room. Though unlike normal clones, these clones seemed to have an actual solid presence in the room. This display left the two teachers gaping. Getting a hold of himself, Uruka commented, Wow, I didn't see that coming. He then gave an encouraging smile to the blonde and continued, that was amazing Naruto I've never seen a clone jutsu like that before. And it looks like a version that is usually reserved for high tune to John and Rank, yet you pulled it off flawlessly if you don't mind, can you tell me how these clones work? Naruto smirked and said, sorry sensei, but a good ninja never reveals his tricks. Fair enough, you have more than earned to wear this. He pulled out a leaf forehead protector out of the box beside the table his sat at and held it out for the whiskered protein. Congratulations he finished with a huge grin on his face. All right Naruto whooped as he jumped for his forehead protector, accidentally tackling Aruka in the process. After embarrassingly apologizing, Naruto took off the goggles he wore on his forehead and tied the leaf symbol in its place. After the rest of the class got their headbands, we find Naruto sitting on the swing giving a quiet chat with Tora, having earlier given his congratulations to Hinata as she went to her family's home to tell them the good news. So absorbed was he with his conversation, that Naruto was able to ignore some of the dirty looks a portion of the parents were shooting his way. Man that was easy I owe you Tora, that clone jutsu you showed me was amazing Naruto whispered to the summon. Fei, I personally think you could have done better, Tora taunted at the now fuming Naruto. I mean you should have finished that written test in less than half the time you should, and you still need practice on the full use of the hidden tiger clones. Other than Fatme, I'd give it 6 out of 10. Oh screw you, Naruto grunted at his summon, sensei, frenemy before he noticed Tora stiffened somewhat. What's wrong he asked. The gray pus bag is coming, Tora growled as Naruto focused on his surroundings. Sure enough, Mizuki was approaching him with a smile on his face, despite the negative vibes he was radiating. Thanks to years of honing his instincts, Naruto could tell a person's intent almost as well as Tora can and thanks to this he no longer felt comfortable about the man. Mizuki seemed pleasant enough, but there was always that lingering feeling that he was hiding his true emotions to fool everybody else. Ah good to see you haven't left yet Naruto, Mizuki said in a cheerful voice. What's up Mizuki-sensei Naruto asked, internally cautious but remaining pleasant on the outside. Mizuki wasn't the only one who could act. First of all I wanted to give you my congratulations on passing. Though the teachers have run into a slight snag, Mizuki explained, you see, after going over the numbers, you using those unique clones of yours and the good results of the rest of your test have given you a tied score with Sasuke. Normally this wouldn't be a problem, but since Sasuke's place as the top student, your scoring makes team placements a little harder. So it was decided by the staff that each of you would be given an individual test and the one who scores the highest will get top student rank. We'll be able to work out team assignments from there. Naruto nodded while mentally frowning. While Mizuki's reasoning seemed sound, he still felt weary from the sense of foreboding he was getting from the Chunin. Tora's constant growling didn't help much either. Deciding to play along, Naruto questioned, so what's the test? Internally smirking as his plans came together, Mizuki gave the demon brat his instructions, confident he'd be successful with in both getting the scroll of seals and ridding the world of the Nine Tails once and for all. Time skip, later that night. I still think this whole plan of yours is one of the most boneheaded stunts I've ever heard of in my entire life. And trust me, I've seen some doozies in my time, Tora pointed out to Naruto as said boy quietly crept through the Hawkage Tower. Lay off with ya the way I see it. If Mizuki's telling the truth then no harm, no foul, Naruto thought as he sensed for any hidden Anbu. And if Mizuki wasn't on the up and up, I've got a backup plan just in case. Your funeral, Tora grunted as he idly floated behind the boy. Once they reached the room that held the scrolls, the two couldn't help but admire the sheer size of the place. Unfortunately, their awe cost them their focus so they didn't notice the presence behind them. What are you doing in my home at the middle of the night an old yet firm voice asked behind Naruto, causing him to yelp and spin around only to see the third standing behind him. Oh crap, plan B Naruto thought in a panic as he quickly gathered the necessary chakra. Transform he yelled. G-A-H. Scene skip, forest. I take it back, that was the dumbest plan I'd ever seen in my entire life. Honestly can't believe that worked, Tora said in a deadpan as his left eye twitched. I know what you mean. Can't honestly believe my luck. Who knew the old man was a pervert Naruto asked aloud, since there was no one around to see him talking to his imaginary friend. Now let's see Naruto mused as he opened up the scroll and taking a look at its contents. Oh look, they've got something called shadow clones in here, might be useful to look at later. Now let's see what else is here Naruto pointed out with an interested hum. After a moment or two, Naruto called out, ah, this'll work. Taking a peek at what his summoner was looking at, Tora gave a growling chuckle. Oh yeah, I can see you working with that. 
It was a few hours of practicing later when Naruto was lying on the ground panting heavily with a satisfied grin on his face. Nailed it, he declared. I finally found you an irritated voice commented in front of him. Looking up, Naruto found an annoyed looking Uruka standing over him. Oh hey Uruka sensei, what are you doing here Naruto asked as he got up onto his feet. W what am I doing here is that all you've got to say for yourself Uruka yelled as he bopped Naruto over the head, causing him to find himself in dirt. Oh, 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 Naruto whined as he nursed the swelling bump on his head. Looking up at the seething instructor, Naruto asked, Hey what gives I do this stupid bonus exam and this is the thanks I get. Uruka gained a confused look on his face. Bonus exam what are you talking about? I totally called it. Tora stated in his undetectable mode while Naruto gained a more alert pose while trying to keep his cool. What do you mean Sensei Mizukai-sensei told me that the academy needed me to take the scroll in the Hawkage Tower and learn a jutsu from it for them to help with the team placement he asked before his Weltened instinct started screaming at him of incoming danger. Before he could react, the whiskered boy was roughly shoved to the side as the sound of multiple sharp objects slicing through the air assaulted his ears. Getting up, Naruto looked in shock as Uruka was pinned to the side of the shed in the clearing they were in by a multitude of kunai and shuriken. Fortunately none of them were in fatal areas, but it would still be extremely painful to experience. Looking up, Naruto saw Mizuki crouched in the tree above the two dressed in stealth gear and with two massive shuriken strapped to his back. Hearing a cough, Naruto turned to Uruka who was glaring up at Mizuki while he took the knives out of his arms and legs. So that's how it is the scarred teacher grunted. Mizuki, a look of urgency on his face, called out to Naruto. Naruto, give me the scroll Uruka's after it and he'll kill you to get it. Like any idiot would believe that, Tora said flatly, not believing how gullible Mizuki thought his summoner was. While the one lie was somewhat believable, that one was clearly thrown together on the fly. Tora got comfortable up in a nearby tree branch to see how his host would do in this situation, while still being close enough to intervene if things got out of control. Let's play along for now, see how this goes. Naruto mentally thought along the same lines as the Bakemono while putting on an act of being confused. Don't listen to him Naruto Uruka shouted out at the boy, struggling to move through the pain. That scroll contains village secrets you need to get out of here now and defend that scroll with your life. Seeing that Naruto seemed to be hesitating, and that Uruka was for all intents and purposes out of commission, Mizuki figured he could drop the act. Sighing before gaining a wide, insane grin, Mizuki said, Oh well, it was fun while it lasted, before pulling one of the giant shuriken off his back. Hey Naruto, he called, getting the boy's attention. Do you want to know why the villagers hate you? Knowing where the traitor was going with this, Tora couldn't help but groan, Oh you've gotta be freaking kidding me. Uruka also knew where the other Chunin was going with this and yelled out, No you mustn't tell him Mizuki the law. Honestly curious on what the treacherous former sensei was going with this, Naruto gave a confused look and asked, What are you talking about what law? Mizuki's grin was downright demonic at this point as he continued, Do you know what happened 13 years ago Mizuki cut in. Naruto, getting a sinking feeling on where the sudden change in subject was going, answered with a trembling voice. Of course I can't know what happened the Kyubai attacked and was K killed by the fourth, but W what does he was again cut off by the Shuriken wielding Chunin. The Kyubai was never killed Mizuki spoke, that night, the fourth chose a newly born infant to seal the demon into. Do you want to know who he chose he asked grinning wickedly, staring into Naruto's ocean blue eyes. He chose you are the nine-tailed fox, the demon that ravaged this village and stole Aruka's parents away he shouted. Naruto was stunned, finally understanding now why so many in the village seemed to hate him. All the pieces started to fall into place. Who else knew about this certainly the Hawkage, but what about his classmates the Ikarakas Tora his mind started to go through a whirlwind of emotions. Mizuki, seeing the blonde was distracted, gave another wicked grin as he prepared to throw his shuriken. Now you can just die, demon spawn he shouted as he threw the spinning blade. Naruto was able to snap out of his trance in time to notice the blade coming for him. Oh crap, was all he could think before he was once again knocked to the ground. Looking up, Naruto was shocked to see Uruka crouched protectively over him, the large shuriken lodged in his back. Are you alright? And Naruto he asked shakily, some stray from the corner of his mouth dripping onto Naruto's whiskered cheek. W.Y. Naruto asked weakly as seeing Uruka risk himself like that for the supposed killer of his parents really made him confused. Giving a shaky breath, Uruka explained, My parents, after they died there was nobody to compliment or acknowledge me I always acted like an idiot, just to get people's attention since I wasn't all that good at academics. It was better than being nothing, so I kept acting like an idiot. It was so painful Naruto, you must also be in a lot of pain. I'm sorry I wasn't able to look out for you more. Naruto was silent through this exchange, but his blonde bangs covered his eyes as his sensei went on. At the end of Uruka's speech, twin trails of tears ran down his whiskered cheeks. Gently moving out from under Uruka, Naruto turned to the direction of the traitorous gray-haired man. Mizuki sneered down at the blonde, Oh, you got something to say to me, brat well make it quick so I can kill you and be on my way. Shut up, Naruto said in a whisper before he fully looked up at Mizuki, his eyes holding a righteous fury. If you so much as lay one more hand on Urukase and say I'll kill you he growled while focusing some of his own killing intent hardened through the rigorous years of harsh training and being exposed to Tora's massive killing intent. 
while he was still in shock over the massive bombshell dropped on him. One of the first lessons Tor taught him was, if you ever hesitate while in a battle, your enemy will never hesitate to kill you so take any shock, any petty grievance you might have, and save it for when the battle is over. If you must, turn it into focused anger that can be unleashed upon your enemy. So while he was still stunned, he was able to put it into the back of his mind for now and focus all his feelings at the man who tried to trick him. His killing intent was so intense that it caused Mizuki to take an involuntary step back, before he regained his bravado and gave a maniacal laugh. Ah, you are going to kill me I'd love to see you try I'll kill you in one move, Mizuki boasted while he took his remaining shuriken off his back and took a ready stance. Just try it I'll turn anything you throw at me back a thousand times over Naruto shouted out while plucking out five hairs and blowing on them. Hidden Tiger Clone Jetsu Naruto shouted as the clearing was filled with smoke. When the smoke cleared, five Naruto clones stood beside the original. Mizuki, however, just scoffed, PFT, if I was just seeing this I might be surprised, but even with five of you I can easily take you on he roared and he hurled his shuriken like a boomerang, causing the clones to scatter. As Mizuki started to charge at the clones, Naruto smirked and put his hands into a seal while muttering, release. In another puff of smoke, the clones were suddenly replaced by five huge and angry-looking tigers. The Chunin halted while going witty eat and pale at this sudden change of events. The tigers started to circle the man when they all started to play a game of literal cat and mouse with him. When one tiger would charge, Mizuki would jump to avoid it while another would jump him as he had his guard lowered. This went on for several minutes and soon Mizuki was littered with cuts and scrapes from the tigers while panting heavily and the tigers themselves were once again circling him like hungry sharks. Grinning, Naruto called out, Hey Mizuki you know that jutsu that I learned from the scroll well. Get ready to experience it first and getting into a crouching position that was mirrored by the clone tigers, Naruto shouted out, Tiger version, fang over fang. With that, all five of the transformed clones became what looked like drills made of flesh, bone, and claws that darted towards the now screaming traitor. They clashed in the middle, and there was a loud explosion from the impact that kicked up plenty of dust and dirt. Haruka, staring witty at the display found his voice a moment later. D did you kill him he asked hesitantly, unsure of how anyone could survive such an onslaught. Maruto turned to the wounded Chunin and gave a big cheesy grin and a thumbs up before the clone tigers went up in puffs of smoke to reveal an out cold but very much alive Mizuki who lay pitifully on the ground. The man was black and blue all over and looked like he got on the wrong side of several alley cats, but he'd survive. Naruto was able to lift the injured Uruka up onto his feet and started to carry him back to the village while he summoned a human-formed clone to carry the scroll and another carried a still-out cold and tied up Mizuki. Do you think you'll be okay? Sensei Naruto asked as he stared at the wounds and worry. Uruka just waved it off. Oh, I'm sure I'll be fine once the medic nins take a look at me. In the meantime, you'd better stick close to me until we get this whole mess sorted out, he stated, slightly surprised that the Ambu haven't stumbled upon them yet. Naruto, however, gave a giggle at this. Seeing his teacher's confused look, Naruto elaborated, Oh, you don't need to worry about that sensei. Before I left with the scroll I made sure to leave a note for the old man explaining why I was taking it. That way, if Mizuki was tricking me, he'd have the ambu on him faster than an Akamichi on barbecue he finished with a triumphant grin. Uruka seemed surprised at that. So you were expecting Mizuki to trick you, he asked. Naruto gave an affirmative nod. Kinda, yeah. While his reasoning for me taking the scroll was good, I felt there were a few too many blanks that weren't getting filled out. So I figured that, since Mizuki never said not to, I'd leave the old man a note on why the scroll was missing. Maruka could only chuckle at his student's forethought. While seeming to be a hopeless idiot at times, Naruto truly did have a good head on his shoulders. Similar to Shikamaru, Uruka felt Naruto held back some of his potential in class. So Uruka sensei about the fox Naruto started, not sure how to proceed. Uruka gave the blonde a gentle smile. Don't worry too much about it Naruto. While I'm sorry you found out the way you did, there is something you need to hear. While I might hate the fox, I don't hate you. I've acknowledged you as one of my excellent students. You may not be the hardest worker and can be clumsy and not everyone accepts you but you already knows what it is to feel pain inside your heart. You aren't the monster fox. You are a member of the Hidden Leaf. You're Naruto Yuzumaki. Naruto was silent for a few moments and Uruka noticed his head was bowed and his shoulders were shaking a little. Naruto he started to say before he was tackled by an orange blur. I R U K S E N S E I the blonde cried in joy as tears of happiness ran down his face. Naruto hugged onto one of his most precious people as he continued to sob in happiness. Oh hey, cut it out Naruto, I'm injured here Uruka admonished the blonde though it wasn't with any malice as he both laughed and cringed in pain. Up above, Tora smiled in approval at his summoner proving the fruits of his labors. Perhaps he was truly worthy of holding a contract with him after all he then grimaced as he knew that the brat would probably be questioning him about Kurama soon enough. While it wasn't a conversation he was particularly looking forward to, it was one that needed to be done eventually. For now though, he'd settle for the joy of the moment where the brat, no Naruto takes his first steps into becoming the legend he knew the boy could be. 1. This may seem similar to some scenes from Kid Kubai after this point. That's because I heavily relied on it for some inspiration. Sorry if this might upset some people, but as they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 2. I got this jutsu idea from an attack used by a character named Bayako from Yu Yu Hakusho. 
The attack is called Beast's Unleashing, and I plan on adding similar tiger-based abilities to Naruto's arsenal later on. 3. The way I see it, the Fang over Fang technique is a hidden jutsu of the Inuzuka clan and is most likely passed on to the secret scroll, plus I've seen several stories on this site with that happening. It may get him in a bit of a rough patch with Kiba, but we'll burn that bridge when we come to it. Also, it was one of the few jutsu I could think of that would strike this Naruto's interest as he already has a clone jutsu and having him learn jutsu like the Flying Thunder God or Reanimation are both unrealistic and overused in my opinion. It had been several hours since the Mizuki incident and was nearing midnight, but both Naruto and Tora were wide awake. Both Summon and Summoner were sitting across from each other on the rooftop of Naruto's apartment, with Naruto looking irritated while Tora merely looked bored. Did you know about the fox Naruto asked with suspicion? While Tora did entertain the idea of lying to the blonde, if there was one thing he took pride on besides his strength it was his honesty. Yeah, I knew, he replied. That simple statement burned away at Naruto's limited temper. And why didn't you ever tell me I'd think that my own summon would have mentioned that little detail he all but screamed at the tiger. Looking unfazed by the fuming child in front of him, Tora said, well, you never asked. Seeing Naruto was about to explode on him, Tora cut the boy off. You know me, Naruto. I don't lie, so if you have ever asked me about the fox I would have told you no questions asked. And before you blow a gasket, use that pea-sized brain of yours to think for a moment. I think it's pretty obvious that the people of the village didn't tell you for a reason. Maybe they thought it would be better for your life if you didn't know, or maybe they wanted to wait for when they thought you were mature enough to handle the news because, let's face it brat, you probably would have flipped out if you learned too soon. Honestly, instead of belly aching about the past you should be focusing on where you go from here. Naruto looked like he wanted to argue further, but soon realized his sensei, Summon was right. Arguing and worrying about the past wasn't going to help his current situation and took a few deep breaths before turning back to the tiger and fixed a serious look on his face. So what happens from here he asked. That's up to you, Brett. As far as I'm concerned, nothing has changed since the day I met you. If you'll want to do something different because of some revelation I won't stop you, but personally I think that it'd be stupid, Tora waved dismissively. Naruto managed a small smile as Tora, in his own blunt way, was comforting him about the Kyubai like Uruke Sensei did. It was then that a thought occurred to him as he remembered something he read in the scroll where he found the summoning contract for Tora. Hey Tora, I remember in that scroll that the Sage of the Six Paths mentioned something about the Jubiais that related to the Kyubai he inquired. Tora was actually surprised by this. It had been a while since Naruto read that scroll, so him remembering such a small detail over this long was fairly impressive, as well as he was able to make that connection off so little evidence. Then again, Tora drilled it into the boy the importance of learning to be observant. After all, it's the predator that's aware of its surroundings that gets the prey. Tora nodded his shaggy head and said, Yeah brat, the two are related in a way. However, that's a story for another day. Besides, you have to start preparing for actually starting your ninja career now. Naruto grumbled at the obvious dodge to his question but let it go for now as he knew that if Tora didn't want to tell him something right now then no amount of pleading, bribing, or threatening would make him change his mind. The tiger would tell him eventually, but only on his terms. Scratching the back of his head, Naruto yawned and said, All right, I know how pressing the issue with you doesn't work so I'll wait for now. Good night, ya stupid cat. Giving a toothy smirk, Tora responded, Don't push your luck, fishcake. I'll see ya in the morning. Later the next day, Naruto had just had an interesting day. First, he got his ninja registration done after having his tiger face paint rejected by the photographer. Then, when meeting with old man Hokage, he then met Kanohamaru, the third's bratty grandson and the boy's closet pervert of a tutor Abisu. One thing led to another and somehow he got Kanohamaru as both a part-time student and rival for the Positon of Hokage, as well as sending Abisu flying away via nosebleed thanks to his improved version of the Y Jutsu mixed with the tiger clone Jutsu that he called the Kitty Harim Jutsu. As the sun was setting, Naruto was getting ready to go back to his apartment with Tora perched on his shoulder as always. However, he then spotted a familiar lavender-eyed girl and decided to go talk with her. Hey Hinata Naruto called out cheerfully. The girl gave a small leap of surprise before spinning around and seeing her secret crush walking up to her. Hey hello Naruto, the heiress greeted in kind. It's good to see you. You excited about us starting our ninja careers tomorrow I can't help but wonder who will be on my team. I hope you're one of them Naruto finished with a grin at the end. Hinata blushed deeply at that and Tora couldn't help but snicker at the girl's obvious feelings for his ignorant summoner. Oh, she is totally still into Blondie and judging by his face he's still completely oblivious to it. It is going to be hilarious when he finds out Tora thought before a Cheshire grin spread on his feline face. Also it'd be even more fun if I helped things along a bit. The two future Genin talked for a few minutes more, each wondering about their future teams and what all missions the two would do. They were just getting ready to head their separate ways for the night when Tora sent a small amount of his hair to act as a trip cord under Naruto's feet. The result was instantaneous. Naruto fell forward and crashed into Hinata who was still standing right in front of him. The two fell to the ground and Naruto felt his lips lock onto something. Opening his eyes, he blushed as he saw that during the landing, Hinata and he had ended up unintentionally in each other with Naruto on top of the girl. While Naruto was blushing, Hinata was going nuclear. 
While a bit more confident than she was as a child, the fact that she was currently in her crush and that it was both of their first made the girl's brain shut down. She fainted. Panicking, Naruto quickly got off of the out-cold Kanochi and was wondering what the heck he was supposed to do now. Tora, meanwhile, was laughing his furry butt off. Jerk. Day of team assignments. Naruto sat awkwardly in his chair, taking care to avoid eye contact with Hinata as said girl tried the same. Both however risked a glance at the same time, met each other's eyes, then quickly looked away from each other blushing furiously. After nearly an hour of trying to wake the Hyuga up last night, Naruto had to carry her back to her home. It was tricky trying to sneak someone home inconspicuously when the entire family has eyes that literally see everywhere, but Naruto was able to pull it off thanks to both his stealth skills hardened from pranks and Tora's training, as well as said someone finally calming down enough to act as a lookout as Naruto carefully placed Hinata on her bed and hightailed it out of there. The two did meet briefly that morning and agreed that there was just an accident and that neither party was to blame. However, it was needless to say that things were going to be somewhat awkward between the two friends for a while. They were so busy stewing in their own protein awkwardness that they almost missed Uruka going over the team assignments. Team 7 will be Naruto Yuzumaki, Sakura Haruno, and Sasuke Uchiha. Both Sakura and Naruto slumped over in a slight depression at this. For Sakura, she was ecstatic to be on the same team as her crush. She was not a fan of being paired with the class clown even though he'd stopped pestering her for dates a while back. For Naruto, he was alright having Sakura on his team but he still butted heads with Sasuke. He'd been fine with seeing Sakura as just a friend about a year after meeting Tora when the summon convinced him that he should focus more on his training than going after a pink-haired harpy who obviously has zero interest in you. Eventually he realized what he had for Sakura was nothing more than puppy love, but he was still interested in being friends with her. The downside was, first impressions were hard to get over, and so Sakura still saw him as little more than an annoying troublemaker. Uruka continued listing the teams, Team 8 will be Shino Aburame, Hinata Hyuga, and Kiba Inuzuka with Akamaru. Team 9 is still in rotation, and Team 10 will consist of Choji Akamichi, Shikamaru Nara, and Ino Yamanaka. It has been an honor teaching you all these last few years, and I know you'll make the Leaf proud you have an hour break for lunch, then meet back here to meet your new sensei. Dismissed. Lunch was a fairly uneventful affair. Naruto asked Sakura if she wanted to meet up with him and invite Sasuke so they could do some team bonding, but she blew him off in favor of going after Sasuke herself which failed miserably. Naruto ended up eating lunch on the rooftop of the academy and discussing his team with Tora, who seemed to think that they had as much a chance of becoming a cohesive unite as a snowhead of not melting in hell. Finally the hour was up and the fresh graduates met in the classroom to meet their new sensei. Time trickled by as each team was picked up until only Team 7 remained. Naruto was doodling in a scroll on possible new combinations he could do with the new jutsu he learned from the forbidden scroll while Sakura stared at Sasuke with hearts for her eyes and Sasuke just glared out the window at nothing in particular. And they waited, and waited, and waited. Finally, after nearly two hours of waiting, Naruto's patience ran out. ARGH where the heck is this guy everyone else has left already he ranted, disturbing Tora out of his nap causing him to raise his head and wipe some of the drool off his fur. So why don't you prank him Tora asked with a yawn. Naruto gave a malicious grin. That was just what he was thinking quickly, he went to work setting up a little surprise for their sensei when he would show up. Naruto, what are you doing? Sakura asked while looking at her new teammate suspiciously. Oh, just showing our new sensei our displeasure for his absence? Naruto grinned back. You're so immature, you moron whatever, just keep me out of it, Sakura snapped before going back to gushing over Sasuke. Naruto merely shrugged his shoulders and went back to setting up his trap before going back to his seat while trying to contain his laughter. It was nearly a half hour later when they heard the door open. Their new sensei was a tall man with gravity-defying silver hair, his head bent slanted over his left eye, and a black face mask covering the lower portion of his face. The rest of his attire was a standard Jonan outfit complete with flak jacket. The man stared at them all lazily for a second before saying, My first impression of you guys is... Before he could finish his sentence, the man tripped over the tripwire Naruto set up and fell forward face first into a pan of used kitty litter Ah, the man screamed in disgust as he quickly stood up and wiped at his face furiously. There's nothing sanitizing about these crystals he shouted before finally getting the last of the unspeakable horror off of him. I hate you the man said in what was an attempt to be a neutral tone but still held some of the disgust he felt from leader diving. Naruto and Tora were howling with laughter at the man's misfortune while Sasuke looked at the man in disappointment for not being able to avoid the juvenile prank and Sakura was trying to apologize to the man while internally she was laughing just as hard as the Jinchuriki in his summon. Finally the man was able to compose himself before straightening up and saying in his previous bored tone, meet me on the roof. He then proceeded to vanish in a swirl of leaves. The group of four met up on the roof a few minutes later and the silver-haired man looked at them all impassively. All right then my cute little Jenin, how's about we introduce ourselves he asked after a moment. What y'all like to know? Sensei Naruto asked. Oh nothing much, just likes, dislikes, hobbies, dreams for the future, stuff like that. Why don't you give us an example? Sensei Sakura suggested. Giving a nonchalant shrug, the man said, all right. 
My name's Kakashi Haddock. My likes and dislikes are none of your business. Dreams for the future aim I have a few hobbies. All we learned was his name the three gen and sweat dropped. Tora just snorted. Way to mess with a group of 12-year-olds minds, weirdo. Naruto sweat dropped. You're the last person who should call anyone weird, Tora. The now named Kakashi pointed at Naruto and said, Okay, Mr. Funny Man, why not you go next? Smiling, Naruto said, Well, my name's Naruto Uzumaki. My likes are ramen, my friends, tigers, and the people who support me. My dislikes are the three minutes it takes to cook instant ramen and people who look down on me, my friends, or my dream. As for hobbies, I guess playing pranks and learning cool new things. As for my dream, at this Naruto straightened up more and gained a confident look, I'm going to be the best hawkage the village has ever seen and I plan on helping my friends out along the way. Well, he's turned out interesting, Kakashi thought before nodding his head towards Sakura and saying, All right. How's about you, Pinky? Looking slightly put off by the nickname, Sakura started, Well, my name's Sakura Haruno. Why like she looked at Sasuke and giggled while blushing, my hobbies cue giggle and blush, and my dreams at this she added in a squeal, not noticing Sasuke roll his eyes at the attitude. Okay, and your dislikes Kakashi deadpanned. An opig and immature idiots like Naruto she stated firmly. Ouch Naruto thought at the harsh dismissal. Ew, burn Tora taunted, to which Naruto subtly rolled his eyes to. Hem, alright. And how's about dark and broody over there Kakashi continued in the same bored tone. Sasuke sighed and looked up at the man. My name is Sasuke Uchiha. I hate a lot of things, and I don't particularly like anything. What I have is not a dream, because I will make it a reality. I'm going to restore my clan, and kill a certain someone. So cool Sekura gushed. As I suspected, Kakashi thought sullenly. Geez, that guy had better not be talking about me, Naruto sweat dropped. Okay, it's official, this kid has issues, Tora noted. Kakashi squinted his visible eye up into what could be considered a smile and said, Well, now that introductions are out of the way, let's get down to business shall we tomorrow, meet at training ground 7 at 7 a.m for survival training. The trio looked confused so he explained, There's one last test you have to pass to see if you'll be Genin of the village, and I'll be giving it to you tomorrow. Then what was the point of the test we passed here Naruto asked annoyed. That was just to see if you had the ability to be useful and weed out the hopeless cases. This test will see if you have what it takes to be Genin. Just so you know, this test has a 66% failure rate, meaning out of the eight teams formed this year, it's likely only one or two will pass. At best, if you fail, you'll be sent back here for another year before getting to try again. This got all the Genin hopefuls to pale yet gained a determined look in both Sasuke and Naruto. Now, remember to be at the grounds at 7am, tomorrow. Oh, I'd recommend not having breakfast either, you'll just puke it up. He then vanished once more in a swirl of leaves, leaving the three on the roof alone. Well, you're boned, Tora supplied helpfully, to which Naruto facebombed and groaned. Time skip. Man, if I'd have known him taking so long was a regular thing, I'd have brought a book or something. Tora yawned in a bored tone the next day as it neared 10am, and Kakashi was nowhere in sight. Oh, shut up. Naruto grumbled to his summon in a tone no one but the tiger could hear as his stomach let out a. He'd followed his new sensei's instructions to the letter, and this is how he's repaid if I'd have thought. I would have brought my prank supplies again, but no instead I brought all my survival gear for this. This s, he thought glumly. Whereas he Sakura grumbled, looking just as tired and hungry as Naruto felt. HMPH was Sasuke's reply. Suddenly there was a swirl of leaves and Kakashi appeared in the clearing. Yo, he said casually. Leaping to his feet, Naruto yelled, Where the heck were you, you jerk? Oh, I got lost on the road of life, Kakashi shrugged. I honestly don't know how to respond to that. I've been around for a long time, and that has got to be the lamest excuse I have ever heard, Tora said blankly. Ignoring the death glares he was receiving from his genin, Kakashi walked over to the training posts and set an egg timer on top of the middle one. Turning towards the trio, Kakashi spoke, This timer is set for noon. The objective until that time is to get one of these bells off me. He held up two small silver bells for emphasis at this. Anyone who doesn't get a bell gets no lunch and will be tied to one of these stumps while I eat lunch in front of you. So that's why he told us not to eat breakfast. The genin thought glumly as their stomachs growled in unison. Man, he's good, Tora muttered, impressed by the Jonin's maneuvering. It was then Sakura noticed something. Um, sensei, there are only two bells. Ah, very good of you to notice that, Kakashi said while smiling with his eye once again before continuing. Yes, this means that one of you will get tied to the stump no matter what. Also, the one who's left at the injits to repeat the academy for another year. What shouted the genin. Sad but true, Kakashi stated airily. Oh, and if any of you want to have a chance at getting one of these bells, I'd recommend coming at me with intent to kill. Oh, he's going to regret saying that, Tora smirked as he floated up into the air to get a better view of the soon-to-be entertaining show. But sensei, isn't that a bit dangerous, Sakura asked nervously. Kakashi I smiled again and said, oh don't worry, I'm sure I can handle whatever you three come up with. Now, get ready and start. With that, the three ninja hopefuls leapt into the tree line surrounding the training field. Kakashi sat in what looked like a relaxed position, but the trained observer could tell that he was ready for anything. They all seemed to be well hidden now. 
Good, Kakashi observed while observing his team's hiding spots subtly. Suddenly, though, an orange blur leapt into the clearing in front of the silver-haired man to reveal a grinning Naruto. All right, Kakashi-sensei, you better get ready to take your lumps, Naruto cried out as he got ready to charge forward. You're a little different from the average genin, aren't you Kakashi deadpan before reaching for his weapon's pouch, causing Naruto to tense. However, instead of a weapon, Kakashi pulled out a book. Not just any book, but one with a bright orange cover and the title Make Up Paradise. Naruto, after pulling himself out of his face plant, angrily pointed at his sensei and shouted, Hey, what's the big idea with the book, you pervert? Ignoring the pervert part, Kakashi casually flipped the book open and said, Well, I was getting to a really good scene and want to know how it turns out. Naruto nearly saw red at this clear dissing of his skills and made a blind charge at the man. Lesson number one, Teijutsu, Kakashi stated before he started ducking and dodging the strikes from the young blonde. After a few seconds of this, Kakashi maneuvered himself behind Naruto with his fingers in the tiger seal. You shouldn't let your enemies get behind you, the Jonin said in a strange tone before he jabbed his fingers forward yelling, Hidden Leaf Sacred Teijutsu, 1000 Years of Death. With that, Kakashi's fingers went where no man's fingers should go on a small boy, causing the blonde to rocket into the air while screeching in pain while clutching his backside before he disappeared in a puff of smoke. This caused Kakashi's eye to show surprise briefly, before looking strangely satisfied. So he learned the shadow clone jutsu and used it to see how I fought, HM he's far cleverer than he let on. I think I might actually have fun with this group, he commented before going off to look for his students. Team 7's true test had begun. 1. Kudos to fairly odd parents for giving me. This idea for a prank note that while I may prank Kakashi a lot in my stories, I'm actually a big fan of his character. I just love messing with him though. Naruto's eyes shot open as he cradled his posterior, the phantom pains of Kakashi's jutsu coming back to literally bite him in the butt. Note to self, always keep myself facing forward when Kakashi sensei is around and check to see if he's on any child predator lists, he mumbled to himself. HM, not bad blondie. It's good to see you've taken my observation lessons to heart. And you were even able to test out your new jutsu to do it as well. Now, what did you learn Tora asked as he laced on a branch above the one said blonde was hiding on. Well, despite how he acts in his appearance, Kakashi sensei has a really strong teijutsu style. I saw a few weak points in any that I did spot he was quick to defend. And attacking his blind spot doesn't work because I think he senses me coming even with my best stealth moves, Naruto noted as he thought about the fight he just experienced through his clone. And what does that tell you the summon egg dawn? That at my current level, I have zero chance of getting a bell before the timer goes off, Naruto concluded with a sigh. I don't think neither Sasuke nor Sakura could do any better though. No sooner had he said this than a piercing scream filled the woods, signaling that either a banshee had moved into the area or Sakura was taken out by Kakashi. And since banshees aren't real, they left the latter as the only option. Shifting his position so his silver eyes could look fully at the whiskered boy, Tora questioned, based on that, what are you going to do next? Naruto thought for a second before sighing. It means I'm going to have to team up with Sasuke, doesn't it? Don't look at me, it's your test, Tora said teasingly before a long ear. If you are going to team up with him though, you might want to hurry. I hear Duckbutt Mikamo getting closer to that Cyclops' position. And while he doesn't terribly, I doubt he's got the skills to take that guy down. Aruto nodded before leaping off the branch to catch up to his dark-haired teammate, leaving Tora to fly above the trees to enjoy the show from above. Pushing his speed, Naruto was able to cut off Sasuke only a while before he came to Kakashi's position. The blonde stopped in the Uchiha's path, causing him to stop his trek forward. What do you want? Dobe Sasuke asked in irritation, knowing he was on a time limit and didn't want to waste any of it dealing with Naruto's shenanigans. Naruto took a deep breath and counted backwards from ten, a relaxation technique Tora taught him to keep a cool head when on the hunt or when fighting, before answering. Sasuke, I think we'll need to team up, Naruto said firmly. To his credit, Sasuke didn't show any surprise at the left field request, just shifted his expression to neutral and asked in a bland voice. And why should I team up with you? Dobe, I saw your fight earlier and you couldn't even lay a finger on him while he took down your clone with ease. Naruto resisted the urge to make a snappy retort and said, that's exactly why we should team up. I could tell that he wasn't even trying in that fight and, while you're good, I think this guy is above all of our levels combined. He's a Jonin for a reason, Yano. Sasuke pondered this for a minute. While he did take pride in his abilities, he took care not to get blinded by them. After all, he needed a clear picture of his skills for the day he found him. As much as the Uchiha hated to admit it, the whiskered boy proved a strong point. Just from the short exchange between Kakashi and the clone had shown that the man didn't waste a movement and each of his strikes was precise. If the Jonin was anywhere close to his level, then Sasuke knew he wasn't ready to fight him toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Yet, all right Dobe, what did you have in mind Sasuke finally asked, knowing the blonde was his best shot at passing. Despite his reputation as a dunce, Sasuke knew Naruto could have a sharp wit when it came to the battlefield, as well as a penchant for traps if most of his pranks were anything to go by. Naruto grinned and began. All right, first thing we need to do is find Sakura and see if she'll be able to help. 
This is a three-person job after all. Next, wheel. Several minutes later. Remaining time, 30 minutes. Kakashi stood nonchalantly in a clearing in the forest, idly flipping through his book. They're going to make their move soon, he thought, his eye on the pages but his other senses were on full alert. I wonder if any of them have grasped the true meaning of the test it would be nice to pass a team for once, especially with all of the potential this one has. Oh looks like they're moving. Ten Naruto leapt into the clearing the second he thought this. Half of the clones pulled out Shuriken and Kunai while throwing them at him while the other half transformed into tigers and charged at him in a fury of fangs and claws. Knowing he'd have to take this a bit more seriously, Kakashi put his book back into his pocket and got ready to defend. Taking out a kunai of his own, he used the blade to deflect the projectiles thrown his way while simultaneously jumping out of the tiger clone's reach. Fire style. Fire Jetsu Sasuke's voice rang out from behind him. What Kakashi thought, his eye widening as he turned his head to see a fire the size of a large boulder come pelting towards his unprotected back, a smug-looking Sasuke standing behind it. So, Naruto would force me up into the air with his clones leaving Sasuke an opening to attack me while I'm in midair and can't defend myself as easily. Clever, but still not enough to grasp the true meaning of the test. The Hattie couldn't help but smile under his mask though at this new development. This batch of genin were actually making him keep on his toes and were showing the beginning of teamwork. Acting fast, Kakashi threw his kunai at a nearby tree and pulled at a ninja wire he had attached to it in a split second, allowing him to be pulled out of the way of the fire and leaving the five tiger clones to get scorched instead. The second his feet touched the ground, however, the sound of a tripwire being snapped sounded. Kakashi's eye widened as his one leg was snared and he went hurtling up into the air. Acting fast, Kakashi sliced through the rope and started to fall, however he heard just a second too late the sound of a shuriken being thrown. Bracing himself for an attack while falling, Kakashi didn't feel a blade pierce his skin but instead felt the bladed star pass him. Landing on the ground, Kakashi turned to his two present students and gave an eye smile. Nice effort guys, but you still didn't get a bell. That's because I got to a familiar voice cheered from behind the tree he was standing in front of. Turning around, Kakashi was surprised, to say the least, to see Sakura walking out from behind the tree, the two bells clutched in her hand. Looking down, Kakashi saw that the string that previously held the bells had been cut. The shuriken that they threw didn't miss me at all, he thought impressed. They were aiming for the string knowing that I'd probably be too preoccupied trying to avoid being snared to properly dodge it. Then Sakura, hiding behind the tree they herded me towards, snatched the bells as they were falling. Quite impressive, my cute little genin, Kakashi thought with a huge grin behind his mask. Just one more test to see if they're ready. Well, color me impressed. However, now you have to determine which one of you has to go back to the academy, he stated, wondering how they'd react. The trio was silent for a moment before Sakura spoke up, holding out the two bells to the boys. Here, you two should have them. Without the two of you waking me up, I would have still been passed out from a simple jinjutsu, and the only reason I was able to snag the bells was because you two were able to bait Kakashi sensei like that. If anyone deserves to go back to the academy, it's me. No way Sakura Naruto protested. Sure, he no longer had a crush on the girl, but that didn't mean he wanted her to fail. It was you being able to calculate how Kakashi would dodge that we were able to set up that snare for the trap. Not only that but you were able to get the bells the second they fell without Kakashi Sensei noticing. And Sasuke, loath as he was to admit it, Naruto knew when to give credit when credit was due. Sasuke was able to not only use the fires to distract Sensei, but he was able to cut the string of the bells without him noticing. Besides, he gave a confident grin at this, I was able to make it through the academy once, right I should be able to do it again way easier this time. HN, Sasuke grunted, the dobe has a point, but it was his plan in the first place to bring us all together. We'd probably be running around like chickens with our heads cut off instead of actually completing the objective. I'll head back to the academy and get a team with the next graduation. As each of them said that the other two should be the ones to pass, Kakashi couldn't help but smile brightly at how these young ninja were able to stick up for each other despite their clashing personalities. Kakashi made a noise with his throat to gain the group's attention. Well, since none of you can agree on who's to go home, I'll decide for you, Kakashi said ominously as dark clouds seemingly gathered behind him. The person going back to the academy as he paused for dramatic effect just to shake them up. It worked as all of them, even the stoic Sasuke, had a bead of nervous sweat on their foreheads. None of you all pass, congratulations on becoming official ninja of the hidden leaf he finished with a cheerful tone. There was a beat of silence before what was the shouted response of both Sakura and Naruto, Sasuke himself settling for widening his eyes while Tora, unseen by all except Naruto, laughed hysterically as he had watched the whole thing. Naruto was the first to express his thoughts. What do you mean we all pass I thought you said if we didn't have a bell, we'd go back to the academy. I lied, came Kakashi's blunt response. One of the skills you need to learn is to look underneath the underneath, which includes deciding what is true or not. It was merely to disguise the true meaning of this test that you all exhibited, even if it was unknown to you. Care to guess what it was seeing them all nod, Kakashi elaborated, teamwork. One of the most important aspects of being a leaf ninja is a strong basis of teamwork. Look over there, he said while gesturing. 
to the memorial stone in their training area. Written on that stone are all the names of Kanoa's famous heroes who had died in order for their comrades to live. A friend of mine once said, those who break the rules are trash, but those who abandon their comrades are worse than trash. It is a credo that I live by and that I hope you all take to heart. You three, even though you all have your differences, were able to work together for a common goal, even if it meant one of you would have failed. And when it came down to a choice of who passed and failed, you all stuck up for each other. That is the type of mentality it takes to form a proper team, so congratulations Team 7 is now officially formed. Naruto and Sakura cheered while Sasuke gave a somewhat happy smirk. The moment was ruined when the children's stomachs gave loud growls. The three blushed and Kakashi chuckled. I guess we should have lunch and then we'll discuss how our team is going to work for training and missions. Fortunately I brought food for everybody, so let's all head back to the clearing shall we? With that, Kakashi turned and headed over to the spot they all started at with Sakura and Sasuke in tow. Naruto followed but stuck behind a little to discuss the test that just happened with Tora. The summon was lightly sitting on the blonde's shoulder while he began to prattle on out of the corner of his mouth how awesome it was he had passed. Don't get why, Brett, Tora admonished the whiskered boy. This is but the first true milestone when it comes to how far you have to go. Don't get complacent, after all, the Y wolf gets impaled by the buck. I know sensei, but like you said, I was able to pass the first hurdle into becoming Hawkage I can't wait to get started on all the cool missions ninja can do, like rescuing princesses and defeating bandits Naruto whispered excitedly. Tora stared at the boy for a minute before deciding that he was being serious. The Bakemono then began to laugh uproariously. It started as a low chuckle but soon became a full-on belly laugh. Tora laughed so hard that he fell off Naruto's shoulder and onto the ground, still clutching his stomach and laughing his hardest. What Naruto asked in concern, worry. Tora just continued to laugh and Naruto, in irritation, checked his surroundings before chucking a shuriken at the large tiger. Tora yelped and scrambled out of the way of the bladed star lest he get a very close shave and a haircut. What Naruto demanded forcibly this time. Kid can't take a joke, Tora muttered before flashing a fang grin at Naruto. Oh, I'm sure you're going to be delighted at the kind of missions they'll start you off with. Naruto didn't like the sounds of that, and Tora's echoing laughter afterwards did little to ease his worries. One this is just a small joke at the fact many people consider Sasuke's hairstyle to resemble a duck or chicken's butt. Oh Tora, my baby mommy missed you so much sobbed a large woman as she hugged a struggling cat with a ribbon on its ear to her generosity. Somehow, Naruto knew this was Tora's fault, and not the cat getting smothered either. The summoned tiger was among the rafters of the Hawkage Tower, his feline face screaming amusement at the scene below. He'd had the same look on his face ever since Team 7 started taking on missions. Said missions had been a bit of a disappointment to Naruto, much like the Hawkage Monument is a bit big. The blonde wasn't a complete idiot. He knew they wouldn't be tackling S-ranked missions right after graduating from the academy. He just expected the D-rank missions to be a little less mundane. Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura had been doing what was essentially chores and community service for the last few weeks, and even the stoic Sasuke was beginning to show signs of irritation at the missions. The cat alone they had captured no less than five times this week. They'd only been able to catch it as quickly as they did thanks to both Naruto and Sasuke's hunting skills. When Sakura asked both boys where they learned to hunt, Naruto just laughed awkwardly and Sasuke just blew her off. The blonde Genin swore that both his sensei and summon were getting off on this, even if the former wasn't aware of the latter's presence. Finally, after the large woman and her now passed out cat left, the group's attention went back to the third Hakage and Uruka, who were tasked with handing out team assignments. Good job, Team 7, Uruka congratulated the silently sulking Shinobi. Brining up some don'ts, he continued, Now, for the next mission we have some options such as painting Mr. Miyaga's fence, moving some antique furniture for Mr. Chan and... Nope you in no way Naruto exclaimed while crossing his arms in front of him. There is no way that I'm doing another lame chore come on old man, give us a real mission this time. Veins popping on his forehead, Uruka yelled, Stop being so disrespectful, Naruto. As for the others in the room, Sasuke nodded in silent agreement. Kakashi looked resigned. Sakura seemed annoyed by her teammate, whereas the third looked a combination of exasperated and amused. Tora, meanwhile, was chuckling at his summoner's behavior, wondering if the brat realized that by acting this way, he was basically portraying the opposite image of maturity that he wanted the adults to see him with. Naruto, you might not fully realize how the mission ranking system works but the third began before Naruto cut him off. I know that we can't be doing missions like rescuing princesses and stuff as Genin, but give us a little credit, old man, Naruto huffed. All's I'm saying is we're ready for something a little more challenging than painting fences and chasing cats. Internally, the adults were actually impressed that Naruto wasn't wanting to jump the gun and go straight for the Jonin level missions. Sasuke and Sakura were just impressed Naruto could make what sounds like an actually decent argument instead of pouting like a spoiled toddler. Tora, still relaxing in the rafters, leaned forward in faint interest in seeing if his summoner will get his wish. Blowing out a puff of smoke from his pipe, the third asked thoughtfully, Well Kakashi, do you believe Team 7 is ready for their first C-rank mission? 
coughing into his fist in thought, Kakashi said, Well, while they're still a bit wet behind the ears, a simple mission shouldn't be too difficult. Sarutobai nodded as he pulled up some don'ts. As it happens, we do have an escort mission available. I'll introduce you to the client. He then addressed one of the doors at the other end of the room that slid open. The man who stumbled in was less than impressive. An elderly man with glasses, dirty work clothes, and a liquor bottle clutched in his hand. The man looked at Team 7 through blurry eyes before turning to the hawkage and saying in a slurred voice, Hey, what gives I ask for bodyguards and you give me a group of brats none of them look like ninja to me. Especially the shorty with the dumb face. Ha who's the shorty with the dumb face Naruto wondered aloud before realizing that, while he'd gotten a bit taller over the years, he was still slightly shorter than his teammates. A pause, and then, I met kill you Naruto roared as he lunged towards the drunk. Now, now, Kakashi chided, grabbing Naruto by the back of his shirt. Killing the client is bad for business. Besides, you are a shorty with a dumb face, Tora snickered as he enjoyed the show, almost wishing he had popcorn. GRRRR Naruto growled in an almost animalistic way both for the taunts and that he couldn't reap why vengeance upon those who mocked him. The drunk because of his client status and Tora because the summon could still kick his butt eight ways to Sunday while sleeping. He would have his revenge though, believe it. Anyway, the newcomer huffed as he fully entered the room. My name is Tazuna. I'm a super bridge builder from Wave Country, and you all are going to escort me back home until my bridge is completed, savvy. Keeping a firm hand on the fuming blonde, Kakashi gave the older man one of his eye smiles and said, not to worry. As a C-ranked mission, the chances of combating enemy ninja are slim, so between myself and my cute little gen in here, we'll get you back safe and sound. While this statement would normally reassure clients, Tora's nose twitched as he detected a spike of nervousness and fear coming from the elderly bridge builder. Ha, uh, he thought, looks like the super bridge builder might not be super honest with the other humans. Should I tell the brat Tora mentally contemplated before a savage grin worked his way onto his face. Now this'll be good training for him besides, the worst thing that'll happen is that I'll have to reveal myself to save his skin, and we both knew it'd happen eventually. I'll just sit back and see how this plays out for now. Later, Team 7 met with Tazuna and an unseen Tora up at the gate, each of the ninja with a modest traveling bag set up for the trip. Before they disembarked, Naruto paused at the gate, looking at it with a mixture of excitement and trepidation. This was his first time outside the Leaf Village after all, and was the beginning of his first real ninja mission normally. He'd have been bouncing up and down in excitement at the prospect, but thanks to Tora's encouragement, learned that there are times and places to truly express yourself. Acting like a giant infant at the very start of the mission seemed like a poor decision, especially since he wanted to show the drunken old bridge builder who the shorty with the dumb face really was. He would be the embodiment of quiet dignity and grace, and... Oi brat, the others are leaving already, Tora lazily yawned from his perch upon the large gate. S-O-N-U-V-A Naruto yelped as he quickly hightailed it up to his teammates, nearly tripping in his rush. Yep, quiet dignity and grace. Tezuna raised an unimpressed brow as Naruto came running up. Smooth, brat, are you sure you're really a ninja? Oh, bite me, Naruto grumbled as he fell into step with the group. Are you sure an old drunk like you is really a bridge builder? That super bridge builder to you, runt, Tezuna huffed. Seriously, why'd I have to get a team of snot-nosed brats for protection this kid looks like he couldn't protect a rabbit? Naruto felt his temper flare at the casual dismissal. Hey, this kid is going to be the future Hawkage someday, believe it. Tezuna gave a chuckle. Yeah, a loudmouth like you as Hawkage I'd sooner believe that the moon will come crashing down from the sky. Naruto looked ready to pop a vessel, so to prevent her teammate from actually trying to murder the client, Sakura decided to pick up the conversation. She asked the man about Wave and if it had any ninja of its own. As it turns out, Wave Country was too small of a nation to support its own hidden village, so normally had to rely on one of the other major villages for support, even if the effort was usually costly. As they talked, Naruto felt a familiar weight as Tora landed on his shoulder. Look alive, Brett. I smell lust in the air up ahead, the tiger growled in his summoner's ear. Naruto subtly tensed at that. While the Bakemono was somewhat of a troll and would tease the blonde mercilessly, even he wouldn't mess around about potential threats in the area. Looking ahead, Naruto spot a seemingly innocent-looking puddle in the middle of the road. While this wouldn't be too out of the ordinary, the fact that it hadn't rained in days was more than a bit suspicious. A quick glance at his teammates showed that both Sasuke and Kakashi were aware of the potential trap, whereas Sakura seemed ignorant of the threat. Naruto considered letting the girl know of the danger, but couldn't think of a way to warn her without tipping off whoever had set up the trap. Plus, since Kakashi seemed to be aware of the threat, he probably felt confident they could handle it if things went sour, least he have them retreat. As they passed the puddle, Naruto's instinct suddenly screamed at him. Whipping around with kunai in hand, the blonde had just enough time to see two human figures rise up out of the puddle and wrap a surprise-looking Kakashi in chains. Both men were fairly short and had shaggy black hair framing hidden mist forehead protectors. More concerning were the gauntlets the men wore that connected the chain. Each finger was sharpened and unless Naruto's nose was deceiving him, was coated in poison as well. There was no doubt their attackers were enemy shinobi. One down, one of the assailants stated as he and his partner pulled on the chain. 
The barbs on the chain cut through Kakashi easily, sending him to the ground in pieces. Sekura screamed at the sudden attack and death of their sensei. In a move that was too fast for the untrained eye to follow, the duo assassins moved in a flanking position behind Naruto, claws poised to strike. However, when their attack landed, Naruto disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Before the ninjas could register that they had only attacked a shadow clone, Naruto was behind one of them and put the man into a chokehold. Before the mist ninja could move his arms to try and dislodge the boy, another Naruto popped out of the ground before transforming into a tiger midair and clamping its jaws around the man's armored wrist. While the gauntlet prevented the man's arm from being shredded, the force of the bite effectively pinned the man in place as another Naruto shadow clone jumped out from behind the main Naruto and grabbed his other arm, holding a kunai aimed at his ribs. The other attacker tested as he saw his brother get immobilized. Detaching the chain from his gauntlet, he focused his attention on their main target so he could then go help his fellow assassin. Sekura quickly jumped in front of Tazuna in a defensive stance as she saw the enemy ninja target him. Fortunately, Sasuke was able to intercept the man he could reach the less experienced Jenin. Sasuke kicked the man's gauntlet to the side while at the same time throwing two shuriken at the man's shoulders. Hissing in pain as the metal star sunk into his flesh, the remaining assassin decided he needed to fall back and regroup with his associates before trying again. Clearly, the ninja the bridge builder hired were less green than they'd thought. The man turned, only to get a lariat by the still very much alive Kakashi, who held the other assailant under his arms after taking him off of Naruto's hands. Surprised by her sensei's apparent survival, Sakura looked to see where the Jonin had apparently been killed at, only to find bits of log on the ground. It had been revealed that Kakashi had used a simple substitution jutsu to escape, and had used the opportunity to see if he could find out who the apparent assassin's target really was. Good job though, team, Kakashi said with an eye smile. Naruto, Sasuke, commendable work holding these two off. In Sakura, it was quick thinking protecting the client like that. Now, at this, Kakashi's tone became more serious as he eyed a suddenly nervous-looking bridge builder. I think you have some explaining to do, hey Tazuna. After tying the two mist ninja up, Kakashi revealed that the two were known as the Demon Brothers, a pair of Rus Chunin from the hidden mist village. He then explained that having enemy ninja was outside the parameters of a simple C-rank mission and was closer to a B-rank or higher. With only a bit of pressure, Tazuna quickly caved as to why he had ninja after him. About a year ago, Wave Country fell into the sights of a man named Gadu. While publicly known as a wealthy shipping magnate, Gadu's main business is dealing and smuggling illegal merchandise while using different ninjas and gangs as his enforcers. He had basically seized control of Wave's shipping industry and in turn holds a monopoly over all business in Wave. The only competition he had left was the bridge that Tezuna was building, which was why he now had Gadu's hired muscle after him. Because of the country's poverty, however, Tezuna was unable to file for a higher-ranked mission class. So if you quit the mission now I'll definitely be killed, Tezuna concluded solemnly. He then gained a slightly mischievous glint in his eyes as he continued, but no need to worry about it after all. If I die it'll only cause my cute little grandson to cry for a few days not to mention my daughter will hold a grudge against the Leaf Village for the rest of her life not to mention that the people of Wave will continue to suffer under Gadu's thumb until the country withers and dies but don't worry, it won't be your fault at all. Team 7 all gained deadpan expressions at the obvious guilt trip, whereas Tora was laughing his furry butt off. Yeah, I might just end up liking this old drunk after all the baked mono chortled. Resigned to the fact that they were in this mission for the long haul, Kakashi reluctantly agreed to carry on the mission. Sending a note back to the leaf via a quickly summoned dog in order to have someone pick up the still tied up demon brothers, the group continued on its way. Eventually they reached the seaside where a small fishing boat was waiting to take them to wave. The owner of the boat told them that they'll need to be careful in their approach in order to avoid detection from any of Gadu's men. As they slowly made their way across the water, Naruto had a quiet conversation with Tora near the back of the boat and out of hearing range of the others. So Brett, is this enough excitement for you? Tora asked with a Cheshire smile. I know you're mocking me, but I'm actually excited for this a big mission on my first time out of the village rescuing a country from a corrupt businessman fighting off enemy ninjas the only thing missing is a princess and I'll have crossed off most of my bucket list before I'm even in my teens Naruto then bit back a yelp as the tiger dope slapped him. The hell he hissed. Don't get why, Brett. Things are undoubtedly going to get harder from this point on, Tora growled in a surprisingly serious voice. Naruto held back from scoffing aloud as he snapped back. In case you didn't notice ya dumb cat, I handled myself just fine against those chunin. You got lucky, Brat Tora practically roared back, startling the blonde. If you had two brain cells to rub together, you'd realize those two were the bottom of the barrel in terms of chunin. Hell, they were barely stronger than that gray-haired wuss of a former teacher you had. And both times they severely underestimated you, thinking you'd be greener than grass. That won't always be the case, Brett. No doubt once this Gadu character realizes that his initial assassination failed, he'll keep sending more and more skilled fighters until the bridge builder is dead. And that's not just about this mission either, Tora continued as his silver eyes narrowed. 
you've said enough times that you wish to be your village's strongest ninja, the Hawkage. Correct well the more famous you are, the stronger the opponents you'll face. Never forget, brat, that even the strongest predator can become the prey if it gets too wide. The seriousness of the Bakemono's lecture kept Naruto in contemplative silence the rest of the trip, while the tiger himself decided to take a nap on the boat's stern. After they landed and the boatmen wished them luck, the group then set out on a foggy path. Naruto, heading his summons warning about more dangerous opponents coming, kept his senses sharp. A quick glance at his teammates showed that Sasuke, while keeping his look of cool indifference, was equally ready for a possible enemy attack. While he couldn't see most of his sensei's face, Naruto was sure Kakashi was even more alert than either of the boys. And Sakura was looking around with a slightly nervous expression on her face, which wasn't much better than Tazuna's own nervous look. Remembering how the girl was the last to react during the previous ambush, Naruto silently resolved himself to helping the Pinquette with her training at some point when their lives weren't in danger. While his crush on the girl had been all but beaten out of him by Tora, Naruto did care for the girl who seemed out of her depth during this mission. His inner musings were interrupted when his ears picked up the faintest of rustlings in the bushes ahead. Acting quickly, he threw a shuriken towards the noise, hoping to flush whoever it was out. When nothing showed up after a couple seconds, Sakura brained the blonde over the back of his head yelling, What the heck, Naruto you almost gave me a heart attack. Clutching the goose egg growing on his skull, Naruto grunted out, B but I heard something. Sasuke, walking up to the bushes Naruto assaulted, pulled back the leaves to reveal an unconscious white rabbit at the base of a tree, the shuriken from earlier stuck in the bark above its head. While Naruto was a bit less sentimental towards small wild animals after hunting them for so long, he did feel a decent amount of guilt for nearly scalping a defenseless rabbit. As he went to go check on the bunny though, Naruto noticed something strange. He'd seen enough rabbits during his time in the woods training to know that a rabbit's fur would only be this color in the winter, and yet it was currently in the summer months. Which meant, everyone down Kakashi yelled suddenly, tackling Tazuna to the ground. Thinking quickly, Naruto tackled Sakura at the same time Sasuke also ducked. They'd barely made it, as a whirling object passed directly over where their heads had been. Hearing a thunk, Naruto spared a glance up and could barely suppress the gulp in his throat as he saw a sword as big as him lodge deeply into the tree behind where they had been standing. A blur of motion later, and a man was standing on the hilt of the sword. Immediately, all of the danger senses that Naruto had picked up over the years started screaming. It wasn't just the man's appearance that set him on edge, but the ominous feeling of lust he seemed to project around himself. While his face was largely covered by bandages, the man's eyes had a cold look in them like one would give a roach. His short spiky hair did nothing to hide his hidden mist forehead protector, and he wore no shirt to cover his muscular body. There was no doubt that this man was an experienced killer, someone who was jonin in rank at least. Tora's words from earlier echoing in his head, Naruto braced himself for one of the toughest fights in his young life. Tora, meanwhile, was perched up in a tree a little ways away from the new arrival. The Bekmono's face was unusually serious as he, like his summoner, could detect the lust this man carried. Now, show me Brett. Show me it wasn't just a fluke that allowed you to summon me. Show me that you're worth calling yourself my summoner, Tora thought, preparing himself to see just what Naruto was truly capable of after all this time. 